You did what I did for the FNAF flavor text. This is the FNAF style. Well, I'm gonna talk about eco-terrorism. Got too excited about jorts. I'm leaving now with my Roomba or your blood on my hands. I'm back, back on my bullshit. What is meme if not air horn persevering? No, this is, this is not a family show. And I quote, many American titties. Why'd you have to bring Dane Cook to this, Andrew? No one wanted that. Oh, you guys are not ready for what I've got today. <laughs> and I've apparently hit the very end of my attention span. Give me like 30 seconds, I'm looking for rhymes. Hello and welcome to Debate This, the show where no one is right, but someone is definitely wrong. In this show, we take time out of our busy adult lives to talk about comic books, video games, and how wa and watching the two times a year I put my life on pause for seven days to mainline the awesome games done quick speed running marathon is the closest that I will ever get to actually enjoying sports. That's um, fair. Yeah, I get it. It was it yeah. was the week I really got into baseball for me. That was my, <laughs> that was my sports. <laughs> you did that thing I always do with Overwatch League. I'm happy for you. Yeah, it was it was my Summer Olympics. What what was your peak moment? Because yeah. I'm I'm stuck between uh, the Doom speed run that was uh, that was Ooh. commentated by Lars or Lawrence, I should say, from Old Funhouse and. <clears throat> the Legend of Zelda run where an R-Wing showed up. Yeah, the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time beta showcase is definitely mm -hmm. up there. Um, where they they cracked they cracked that bad boy way open. And right. it's, it's it's real good. You just have to go. Just go if you're listening, go look up uh Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time uh SGDQ 2022. And just it's it's phenomenal. Um I think that one for sure. Uh there was a couple really good Mario ones. Uh they did Somebody played a Super Mario World Celeste hack where they oh. basically they basically remade Celeste in Super Mario World. And they, it's they pretty gave, fascinating. It's it's incredible. And they gave Mario the like double jump and the and the wall climb that's let that uh uh the Celeste uh, what's her name? What's oh name? uh Mar um, Mar Marine Marianne the the mahogany ma 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 mm, ma, 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 ma the character in Celeste uh, does. Um and then there's a Super Mario Maker, which Matt, this might be for you. There was Madeline. a Super Madeline, Madeline. Thank you. There is a Super Mario Maker relay race. I heard about this. Yeah, I just watched it today. It's it's fascinating. They took hmm. some of the like biggest names in Mario speedrunning. Uh, they split up in teams and they did just like brand new, never before seen uh, levels. And, oh, that's uh, cool. That is some like top tier mario play now andrew yeah, that's is, really yeah, rad, is this yeah. the same event where a professional speedrunner lost um died in super mario oh, sunshine that, also the super mario sunshine run where the the world record holder for the 120 shine so that's like uh, aka the 100 percent completion event mm -hmm. of super mario sunshine he was just like in the zone and he was through one of the like secret um you get your jetpack taken away from you levels mm. in Pino Park. Forty five minutes into the run, he died and got a game over. And the way that people <laughs> and if you know Super Mario Sunshine, um, and especially if you play hundred percent, you have to collect a lot of blue coins and you get the save and the save and continue prompt every time you get a blue oh, coin. Oh, and you so speedrunners speedrunners don't play Mario Sunshine with memory cards because it saves twenty minutes. Wow. Oh. So Ooh. so that's why it was such a big deal because it was like 46 minutes into the run and he's like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> and then people on the couch are like, did you save? He's like, no. Because he didn't have a memory card oh. in it. Because, oh. yeah, it's... But but it was so cool how they just like, they completely just like 180 and they're like, all right, well, we're not going to do... We're going to do a challenge run. It's like, how fast <laughs> yeah. can, how fast can uh, SB get to 65 shines? And it was great. It was a great run. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of video games, today's episode is about one of them. <laughs> That's a what a hell of a segue. <laughs> a video game. <laughs> uh, a pretty, a pretty influential one, if I may add. Now, when you're talking about influential games, there are a handful that probably come to everyone's mind. You got your Mario's, your Sonics, your Ocarina's of Time, whatever. But today, we're going to talk about what I feel to be the single most influential game of the modern era. Gentlemen of Debate This and loyal listeners, it's time to raise our arms to the sky and praise the sun, because today we are talking all about Dark Souls, baby! Oh. 
I'm mm-hmm. interested to hear your case I'll, for Dark Souls being yeah, the most I will yeah, and die on hey, in the also, modern in the modern era. I'm gonna sit here and die on that hill. I yeah, I, yeah. I've got re- I've got the receipts. I don't even know this <laughs> argument, but I see it. I could yeah. I am excited to file them into the Excel sheet of my brain. Uh, just quick special thanks to member of hashtag Butthwomp Nation and all around Sunbro, Mgrum54, for commissioning today's episode. And as always, if you out there want to commission your own flavor text, head on over to patreon.com slash debate this cast. Now, folks, my journey today will be a long one, but fortunately, I won't be making it alone. Joining me in some jo- jolly cooperation are Matt, don't give up skeleton Cole. Kyle, liar ahead, Harper, and Todd, try tongue, but whole Thomas. <laughs> I, These are my favorite Code yes. and Cambria songs. I, I hate it, but I understand the reference. I get it. I've I've been present on the internet during yeah, these memes. You've, so. you've been on the internet since 2011. Yeah. 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 So, guys, uh, like we always do with Flavor Text, tell me, what do you know about Dark Souls besides the memes? Um, I know the memes. I know Praise the Sun is from from this game, and I know its reputation for being a an intentionally difficult uh game. And iframes, iframes are also part of it. <laughs> iframes are definitely part of it. Yes. I know a decent amount about the like actual gameplay of the Dark Souls series. I've watched a playthrough. Of most of them, not all of them. I don't know if I've seen the original Dark Souls, um, but I have watched a playthrough of most of the games and I get the concept of, you know, like it's this RPG game based around um, um, uh, like cyclical mechanics and, you know, really memorizing movements. It's And it's hard as dicks. Um, and I remember when dark souls first got big it was probably around dark souls 2 when somebody said this to me they were like dark souls is the hardest game ever because you're not allowed to sing <laughs> and um i was that's like a well bad that's take. that's a really bad dumb take. and uh yeah so i i just kind of like wrote dark souls off for a while as like a game people mm-hmm. played to play a hard game it was it was like the the triple yes. atomic blazing wings of Quaker <laughs> yeah. Steak and Lube of video games. And I kind of viewed it as that way. But over time and as the game has developed, I've I've come to appreciate okay. the game more. I also know that there's like buck wild crazy lore, but I know nothing about it. That something yeah. Matt said sparked that in my mind too, is like it it has this reputation of of this intense deep lore that yeah. is is not written down anywhere like it's all inferred yep. from from the setting and gameplay and but but everyone well, we're like, gonna get into it oh you guys boy. are gonna know a lot about the the, the buck wild lore yeah I'm i know excited. i know the memes um i a lot of the things that matt said i know the game has uh, dark Souls series has a reputation for just being incredibly difficult um it's all about your iframes and rolling um as far as play goes i think i've watched a little bit of speedrunner play and i think that the mcelroys did some dark souls like partial run yeah. dark souls is is definitely a, a lead in a monster factory yes oh okay. where and i'm pretty sure they tried not to fight anyone um because that seems to be their the, yeah he point. did the, the pacifist right yeah. yeah um is is elden ring part of dark souls it is not so officially, I, but we'll talk. It 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 is part of the extended Souls series. The extended Souls the, universe. Yeah, the, the Souls the D, universe. The DCSEU. Yeah. Dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that I'm more that familiar. Make any no, sense to me? I just wanted to dunk on how DC does theirs. I um am more familiar with Dark Souls and what goes on in that than probably or not Dark Souls shit Elden, Elden Ring, Ring yeah. than the other things just because Elden Ring has been birthed during the time of TikTok. Elden Ring is the spiritual successor successor of Dark Souls. Same gotcha. same creative team, same it's got all the same beats. It's just the next version. So Cool. All right, well let's let's jump in. So, I want to start this is going to be a little bit different because the because as Matt said, the there is a ton of lore with Dark Souls, but it is not experienced linearly. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the game and and what this game actually is, and then we'll get into the lore and and I'll explain kind of the different format here. Um, let's start by talking about about Daddy of Dark Souls himself, <laughs> Kitataka Miyazaki. Um, kind of like a think of like a Masahiro Sakurai for Smash from Smash Bros. He is a, a the next generation like Japanese video game dev auteur. Um, okay. A, a fucking workhorse of a dude. Miyazaki's career, interestingly enough, didn't actually begin with video games like a lot of devs did. Um, he spent almost 10 years of his professional life uh, working IT at Oracle in Tokyo. Oh. Um, and it wasn't until he hit 29 where he decided to switch gears into, uh, into playing video games. So, hey, you out there in your early 30s, it's not too late. Um, he was specifically inspired, he says, by the game Eco, um, which came out on PS2, if anybody remembers that one. Oh, okay. I do not I've remember that one. Wasn't that where you were, like, a guy with a sword guiding a princess through yes, it was the and stuff? it was the predecessor of Shadow of the Colossus. Yes. Got it. So, uh, Miyazaki, after making this career change, was rejected from several developers until he finally got in with a company called From Software. Um, from software at the time was just kind of a, a middling B grade developer. Um, their biggest hit was the Armored Core franchise, which is a, I remember that. Yeah, a series of uh, mech yeah. fighters, basically. Which we say, talked about on Core. the podcast. Okay. It was um, it was Cam Koenig oh, and Nathan Brandt right. from the only Video Game Robot I, show. I, was not, when they were I did here. not record on, so I don't remember that. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Well, there you go. Um, From Software also made a couple other ones. They made a game called Lost Kingdoms for the GameCube, which, Kyle, this might have been a U one. I, I, okay. I, uh, nope. I, uh, Lost Lost Kingdoms was a card battler RPG before KH Chain of Memories came Kyle's out. Kyle's writing wow. it down right now. I'm, I, <laughs> yeah. Google, Googling Lost yeah. Kingdoms how to play in 2022 <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. Yep. 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 Uh, so Miyazaki was pulled in to help pull together this kind of fledgling dark fantasy rpg that had been in development uh in the vein of a previous series that they had from had done called kingsfield um that which was Jap japanese only this new game was going to be called demon souls and as soon as he jumped onto the project he began implementing a lot of changes um <laughs> and and to explain what those changes represent i'll talk a little bit about him himself um so this is from an interview in 2015 uh, miyazaki grew up very poor in a small town outside of tokyo about 80 90 miles outside of tokyo um, he, he recites that as a child, he loved reading, but his parents were so poor, they couldn't afford more than like a couple books a year. Um, and they couldn't afford like manga and like tech, you know, things. So he would just read like textbooks that were in English and other languages that just like anything that he could find, he would just read whatever. Um, he, he also says that he wasn't very good at reading. And as a result of that, the way that he read was he would kind of read fragments and just let his brain fill in the blanks. <laughs> so like hmm. he recounts like telling stories and like reciting these stories about textbooks, uh, uh, you know, like in pieces of data. And it was just like, yeah, sure. Make a story out of that. Um, oh. and, and this wild mentality was kind of how he built demon souls. Um, so it basically the idea was like, okay, let's not hold the player's hands through cinematic cutscene after cutscene after cutscene. Instead, Demon Souls, the, the thing about that made it so unique is that it would drip feed bits of lore in, in these like vague fragments and and purposefully make it um, obscure, purposely make the story obscure so that the story was literally in the reader's behold, uh, reader's opinion, oh, you know, whatever. Okay. Yeah, Beauty is in the Eye of the Beholder. It, the story is mm -hmm. what you want it to be. Um, it was, it was kind of, they're kind of doing the inception thing, right? It was just it was like... You know, whatever you, the story is, what 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 you think it is, what you want it to be, yeah, more more or less. I mean, that's that's kind of what Shadow of Colossus did. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get like yep. a big cutscene at the beginning, and yeah. then you go and kill how many kaiju's, and yeah. then you get a cutscene. Like, yeah, that's you can kind of you it. can you can absolutely follow through that inspiration thread for sure, for sure. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so uh, that this. Um, this cryptic like quality of the game also carries over in the gameplay as well. Um, and, and again, you remember this is 2009, right? Like Batman Arkham Asylum was the biggest game of, of the time. 
This was like the age oh, of okay. mainstream gaming and tutorials where you would have a three hour tutorial. Anyone mm -hmm. ever played Skyward yeah. Sword? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or Twilight yeah. Princess, right? Mm -hmm. This was this was yeah. when gaming was just becoming mainstream and developers, yeah. especially AAA developers, felt the need to just like over index on go here, do this. This is where quest markers became a thing, right? Um, so Demon Souls comes out and the idea is outside of just like a few prompts at the way at the beginning, like this is how the controls are. It's just go. And oh. bear in mind, this is eight years before Breath of the Wild did this, and people fucking loved it. And and this and this is this is this specifically is yeah. why I will say that these games were such a revolution. Um, you get thrown in the action. You're just like, all right, you go figure it out. Go wander. Go figure out what you're <laughs> supposed to do. Um, make, make mistakes. Die. Make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. what makes this different from? say legend of zelda is enemies hit hard and bosses hit even harder and and that's that's the quote-unquote difficulty that's where the difficulty comes in is there's a lot of trial and error um you might get some vague story objective or location that you need to go to but you're just going to kind of wander around until you until you you get hit less <laughs> <laughs> um but you're you're always going forward that's kind of the idea um, now, Demon's Souls did some other really unique things, too, uh, for its time. Now, the game is obviously a single-player experience, but the team added in a multiplayer mechanic where players could leave messages for each other throughout the world. Um, but they weren't just like your tr traditional, like, type in this message and post it. You Messages could only be pieced together using these vague, pre-written words and phrases. I, hence why we get things like, don't give up, comma, skeleton. Right? <laughs> or or try tongue but whole that's that's where the message meme comes from is, okay. is that's the mechanic is you leave little messages and and the the thing is this builds in this you really feel like a sense of community when you're playing because these games are so isolating because literally everything is trying to kill you um and and it's there's not a lot of music it's, it's just a lot of like atmospheric stuff but then all of a sudden you'll run into a message and it'll say like chest ahead and you're like oh, awesome nice. or like try jumping or something but then there's there's this trolley potential here because there could be a chest ahead or <laughs> it could just be <laughs> a cliff where oh. you could just like roll off and die and honestly it's 50 50 be between finding a hidden chest and dying and honestly that's what makes it fun is like when you fall for one of those troll messages it's really frustrating because you've lost all your souls but then you're like all right <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> you got, got me, you got me. Got me. <laughs> yeah so yeah. those those show up because your game is connected to the internet, correct? And it draws in like alternate takes from different universes. More That's or right. Less. That's right. Gotcha. There's another there's another mechanic too where you can actually um, you can read people's blood stains and see like how they died. You don't get no. a lot of context. All you all you see is their character like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> and you're like, there's something bad over there, <laughs> but you don't know what it is. It's like the X's in a Mario Maker yes, level. It is yes. Exactly, like, like someone that. died here. Yeah, it's exactly like that. It's like seeing a thousand X's. You're like, well, something <laughs> happened. Um, so Demon Souls launched as a PS3 exclusive first in Japan in tw uh, 2009, and people fucking hated it. <laughs> <laughs> it did nice. not do well. Um, huh. Its initial week, it sold a paltry 20,000 copies, which is nothing. Um, <clears throat> many people that bought the game had no idea what they were getting into and immediately started returning it. Like, didn't even get past the character creation. Just like, what? Wow. How, how do I game? And it was like, nope. Yeah. And yeah. Yep. Because they, because they me. were expecting, they were expecting, you know, Marwind or whatever the mm -hmm. JRPG equivalent. Sure. Of that. Um, but after a while, it it started to sink in. It became to, it be it grew a cult following. Um, I hate that term, cult following, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I noted, games were making this shift from from mainstream, and all of these games were getting real, real handholdy. And, and what this game did was it offered people an experience that was rare and uh, uniquely oblique. Right? It, it kind of like harkened back to the the NES and early SNES era games like you know you boot up Leg the original Legend of Zelda and it's just like you're in a cave figure it out go yeah that's that's what this yeah. does for people um and that's why people I think gravitate so heavy to, to these um now eventually Demon Souls would go on to sell enough to warrant an international release 
Um, there was some legality because from software changed publishers from Sony to Bandai Namco, which they with whom they still work. Um, so they couldn't do a direct sequel. So Miyazaki, after Demon Souls, after all of that kind of subsided, he immediately started working on the spiritual successor to Demon Souls that he dubbed Dark Souls. So Dark Souls is a more or less a sequel to Demon Souls, hence why they're all related. So, so would you say Got then it. that Elden Ring is a similar yes. type of sequel, quote exactly. unquote, to the... Okay, great. Exactly. Yep. Um, Dark Souls released in October of 2011 for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. The game implemented much of what was done in Demon's Souls and improved on some other things. Um, now, despite some mixed reviews at launch again about the game's difficulty, um, people quickly warmed up to Dark Souls in a way they hadn't for Demon's Souls. We Dark were, Souls, in comparison, was much more polished, and it wasn't an exclusive either, which which definitely helped. We were we were harder than more more we forged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Dark Souls sold 1.2 million copies uh, after five months post launch. Um, so later in 2012. Uh, a PC port released branded as the Prepare to Die edition. Uh, Great. Which officially cemented <laughs> wow. the game's difficulty into its market. That's crazy that this came out a month before Skyrim. Because I certainly remember um, in the months following Skyrim, it was an edgy take to be like, Skyrim's bullshit. Play Dark Souls instead. And like... Mm. Yeah. That, and now, yeah, I mean, the, now these were, one has been named Andrew's most influential modern game yeah. and one hasn't. And, right. And, and the other one you can play on a refrigerator. Yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, From Software released Dark Souls 2 in 2014 and then Dark Souls 3 in 2016, which officially cemented, finished the trilogy. But also during that time, From Software also took that award winning, winning formula <laughs> and asked the question what if Dark Souls but HP Lovecrafty in England? And we got Bloodborne released for the oh, PS4. Okay. Yep. yep, Bloodborne was released for the PS4 in 2015, uh, which then tolls, turned the Souls series into the Soulsborne series. Hmm. So hmm. that's how that works. Um, my later... favorite Matt Damon movie. <laughs> so I just needed to get that out there. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, the Soulsborne identity. Uh, later, <laughs> later they ran that same play with What If Dark Souls But Feudal Japan and released Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, for the PS4 and Xbox One in 2019. Now, the reason that game doesn't get considered wrapped together in the rest of the Souls games is it's actually a uh, a spiritual successor to an old game they made called Tenchu. If you remember oh, Tenchu, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, it was originally built as a Tenchu game. Um, now, most recently, as Todd Todd and Kyle mentioned, in March of 2022, From Software released a yeah, fairly unknown, mildly successful game, <laughs> similar to Dark Souls, called Elden Ring, that's already sold like 13.4 million copies worldwide. Yeah, so that only man. come out in March? Yeah. 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 Oh, my God. It's the, and it's it's the Animal Crossing of 2022. <laughs> yeah. 13 yeah. and a half million copies. Um, it will absolutely be on everyone's Game of the Year list this year. It was a, a fucking massive, massive hit. And um, it, it put out so much good, like content for people who who stream yeah. and make content out of them playing games. Like the what stuck in my mind is either the number of times that people have gotten trolled by reading messages, and it's like jump ahead, and you jump ahead, and there's just a thing that pushes you <laughs> off the ledge, or um, whatever the one scene is in Elden Ring where you're going up a very large hill, and suddenly a dragon just flies into the scene. And ruins your whole day. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, since since its release, Dark Souls went from a solid eight out of ten RPG to what many consider to be one of the greatest video games of all time, and again, single most influential video game of the 2010s, um, inspiring this whole new approach to AAA games gaming, along with an entire genre of video games known as Souls likes. Hollow Knight, for example, is the biggest example mm. of Souls like. Okay. Um, Dead Cells is another yeah. one. It's mm. a, soul, a really popular Souls like. Binding of Isaac, some have called a Souls like, even though it was a little Pre, bit before. Yeah. Um, now, this is my opinion, of course, but I believe that some of the best games that people call, uh, no doubt, and this is why I say this, some of the best games of the 2010s Breath of the Wild, Witcher 3, God of War, the 2017 God of War, all of those were made possible because of Dark Souls. I do not, I wholeheartedly do not believe that we would not have Breath of the Wild if not for Dark Souls. I I mean, when you put it in the 
the from the framing point of like of the 2010s which is the decade i considered like dominated by call of duty and Mm -hmm. and um, right well just that online play like but you're right like breath of the wild witcher 3 god of war um all the indie games that have yeah that take their inspiration from it like it's it is all over the place you just gotta gotta branch out past your your calls of duty and your forts yeah. night and your forts night yeah i definitely see it you know like i i wanted the receipts and i i <laughs> accept your receipts consider consider your reimbursement in the mail friend um but yeah i mean i i don't think that i knew that demon souls was the first you know kind of like open world at the very beginning game i kind of think of soulsborne games as like the and this gets really i don't know (laughs) shitty i guess but I almost think of Soulsborne's games as the modern yeah. Metroidvania. No, I think you're absolutely like, right. I think that's where the Metroidvania genre went. I think the one difference between them is the idea that you don't get specific keys for specific locks, but they have a lot mm. of the same DNA for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure, yeah. So I think to continue, you know, like it would be absurd not to say that Metroid and Castlevania were massively influential games and to say that the peak of the evolution of the metroidvania genre is Mm -hmm. demon souls or not the peak the beginning i'm sorry um yeah i would definitely agree with that take that it is one of the more influential games yeah so last thing before we get into the story i want to talk very very quickly about how the game actually plays um because if i if you guys if you out there listeners take one thing i want to Two things. One, that Dark Souls is one of the more influential games of modern <laughs> era. But two, I would like to posit that Dark Souls is not just a difficult game. Because I think that is an unfair criticism of the, the shitty marketing that the game has had. Um, I want to talk about why people say that. So Can I, real Dark quick? S- yeah. D- sorry, I just want to ask like a clarifying question. Because I think that when you started what you just said, I thought you were going to say, but I need to explain to you that Dark Souls isn't actually that hard. No, <laughs> the way I'm you not saying it, that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying that. I think it's unfair to call it difficult for difficult sake. It is, sure. it is okay. a unforgiving game, but that yeah. that is, that is yeah. the point. Like yeah. to separate well, it from your getting over it's with Bennett's Foddy. Yes, it is <laughs> not. It is not in the same class of getting over it with Bennett. Foddy. What? What I've, and again, like I've not played, what I take the difference here is that you are not an invincible creature in yeah. the Dark Souls. You're not Master Chief. You are, you are but a man. <laughs> yeah, you are but, but uh, man with uh, sword, sometimes armor. You are but a small little hot dog man. Yeah. Um, so let's get into it. So Dark Souls, the best way I could describe it is an action RPG cosplaying as a fighting game. That's it. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, okay. And by that, I mean, while you will gain experience and level up your characters to gain abilities and deal higher and higher numbies, succession, succeeding in this game, really comes down to how good you are at the combat. And that combat is all about learning attack patterns, finding opportunities, finding openings to attack. In addition to your health bar, uh, you have a stamina bar. It's the green bar that you've seen in in, uh, screenshots. And that will deplete with every action. Swing your sword, stamina goes down. It's constantly going back up. Uh, so you've got to watch your uh, you've got to watch your stamina bar, and then watch the enemies' attack animations, and figure out like find identify when you have an opening. Um, also, you can equip a shield that will block damage and stagger enemies to make that opening even bigger, but at the cost of more stamina loss. And of course, there's the dodge roll, which we talked about in the previous in a previous episode, i.e., iframes. Ah. Uh, Kyle, tight tight thirty on iframes for me. Um, you remember um, it? it's, Kyle and it, Todd. It's it's when you you do a thing and you get a, a couple frames of of invincibility, so you yeah, it's use those to, you use those to clip through attacks and and become exactly. god. Yeah, it's why in all the videos of any you... of these games that Andrew's reference, it's just constant rolling. Sometimes it's just constant just, rolling. Just, <laughs> and, and again, like yeah. let me make it clear: if any of us normal humans did that much aggressive rolling onto cobblestone. Yeah. We would, that would kill us alone. Yeah. 
Uh, so when the game begins, you can pick several between several starting classes like knight or thief or pyromancer. Um, now, classes aren't classes in the traditional sense. They just determine your starting equipment and your initial stats. That, that being said, everyone can use everything. And throughout the game, players will develop a sense of like a build to fit their desired play style and their desired difficulty. The easiest way to play Dark Souls, Dark Souls 101, is what is ca often called sword and board. Sword in one hand, shield another. That's it. That's all you need. Um, block, block and swing. Yeah. Great. Love it. Block and swing, baby. Learn the mechanics with the sword and shield. Once you pick up those basics, then you can start to really customize your experience. Then you turn that one-handed sword into a two-handed great axe or big fuck-off club or magic or bows <laughs> or whatever. It's great. Um, now, your stats dictate what you can use. Some, similarly, like a D&D, &D, uh, you've, you've got a bunch of different stats, strength, dexterity, intelligence, yada, yada, yada. Um, and whatever, your, whatever you max out or whatever you put points in stats... That determines what weapons you can use. Um, so you can play with dexterity weapons like daggers or scimitars, which hit quick but light. Or you can get that like big fuck off great axe and just put all your your points into strength. Whatever. Um, that also extends to your armor that you wear too. Armor has weight, so you can have like big fucking stone armor and just soak and just take hits. And, but you can't you know, move. <laughs> have infinite, yeah. Have what's called infinite poise, but you just you just walk like a tank. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that just covers melee. There's also like a ton of magic spells. You can shoot magic darts, and magic missiles, fireballs, uh, lightning bolts, all kinds of shit. Andrew, um, what is your like go-to build when you play one of yeah, these games? I I, def I definitely go back and forth. I think normally I do quick weapons and pyromancy is probably the most common. Okay. Um, when I did Elden Ring, I did a two-handed uh, two-handed like staff. Um, which was really fun. That was a little bit out of... Uh, I didn't do any magic when I played through Elden Ring, which made the game a lot longer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I also had a lot of fun. So yeah, I would say like light weapons and, and fireballs are usually my, my go-to. Nice. Um, yeah, so Dark Souls, a couple of the main mechanics of Dark Souls. Dark Souls, everybody knows about the iconic bonfires. These are the game's checkpoints that are littered throughout the, the world. Activate a bonfire, you will return to that point when you die. Um, bonfires replenish your health, magic, as well as refill your Estus flask, which is kind of your limited capacity healing resource. Um, so there's no potions, there's nothing like that. It's just you have uh, you have X amount of charges on your Estus flask, and then you have to go to a bonfire to recharge it. Um, but the other thing that happens when you go to a bonfire: all the enemies respawn. Ah, uh, beans. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it kind of resets the world. Um, now there is one primary resource throughout the, inter the entire game. That is both a currency and your experience points. And that is souls. Souls are, mm. capital S souls are, that is just like an a, a invisible currency. Um, you collect souls from killing enemies. You get them from random pickups off the ground. You get them from selling things, whatever. Um, souls can be used to purchase items and equipment, and they can be channeled into your stats. So you level up your stats by channeling souls, and you get beefier, you do more damage, carry more things, and so on and so forth. Um, now, the thing about souls is when you die, you lose all of the souls that you were carrying, not ones that you've already channeled or purchased, but just what you have in your pocket. Um, and and then those souls are stuck at the spot at which you died. And when you respawn at a bonfire, you get one chance to go get your shit. <laughs> and if you get it, and if you go and you tag your, you tag your corpse, you can reclaim your stuff. But if you die again, that stuff is gone forever. That's why you see people running back to their dead bodies yes, in that's correct. Elden yep, Ring. That's Even correct. if they just touch it and then die it again. It's like, it's like Shovel Knight. Knight. Yep. Uh. yep. Shovel Knight has a mechanic where Shovel Knight has a mechanic where if you die, you can go and, and, you, and you lose half your gold. Is that what it is? Know, something like that. It's been a couple of years since I played Shovel Knight. Yeah. I was just going to try and say that and not talk over Todd, but I did a bad job, so whatever. <laughs> All good. Uh, now, Dark Souls 1, in particular, also has its own unique resource. That's kind of like a premium soul, which is humanity, capital H humanity. Oh. Um, now, there's a lot of st lore stuff with humanity, but functionally, humanity is a resource that you collect, but they're just a much significantly lower drop rate, much more premium uh, resource. Humanity reverses your character's hollowing, which, again, we'll talk about the lore, but basically makes your, makes your you look like a normal human being instead of a hot dog man. Um, <laughs> Go and just look at anybody, like any play of Dark Souls, you will probably see a very wrinkly faced, like looks like a like a like a raisin person, <laughs> like a, usually nice. a purple skinned raisin person. 
um that's that's a hollow um we'll talk about that in the lore but uh you, if you pop a humanity you can give yourself a normal human appearance again until you die um but humanity also allows you to participate in all of the multiplayer components of the game not just so the messages are kind of its own thing but dark souls added a bunch of other ways to actually play with other people um, they added a mechanic called. Yep, we got an image of a hot dog man. That's a hot dog man in, in the in the the, the For, Google Doc. To to further explain, I believe he meant like a hot dog that had been on the the roller at the gas station all day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, very, it, very very particular kind yeah, of hot dog. yeah 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 yes. hot dog in texture, not in shape. Yeah. Yes. So um, <laughs> thank you for for that clarification. So uh, one of the things that you can do, one of the multiplayer components of Dark Souls, is that people can invade each other. You use it. You use a consumable item, and you can actually invade somebody else's game and just fuck with them. You could just go and just kill somebody while they're playing their game. Oh, uh, that kind of rules! <laughs> it super rules. <laughs> and and the the thing that makes it awesome is you have to activate, and you can also be invaded at any point. But you have to activate your humanity to get invaded. So like, if you really don't want to participate, you don't have to. But like, man, it's just so much fun to like have thirty thousand souls and some, and you're just like, I'm so close to a bonfire, I'm so close to a bonfire, and some asshole with a ten foot sword just wearing comes a loincloth, yeah, <laughs> and, and it does a little <laughs> dance on your on your corpse. Like, that's really why this, this is why these games are great. Um, the other thing you can do is jolly cooperation. You can also so you can actually uh, you can leave summon signs and help other people with their boss fights and then do the same. You can bring other people in to help you with your boss fights as well. So it's it's not just being a dick. So again, to summarize, Dark Souls is obviously you know most notorious for being difficult. I think that is overly simplistic. When I die in Dark Souls, it's not because some bullshit thing I couldn't see one shot me. Like Call of Duty, <laughs> like, or like War. Right. When, when you die in Dark Souls, As, it's because you're bad at the game. <laughs> when you die in Dark Souls, you know exactly why you died every time. Mm-hmm. And nine times out of ten, when I die in Dark Souls, it's because I'm being impatient or I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. Sure. Um, if I, I fully believe, like, yes, it's hard. Less you, you have to you have to learn its systems and meet the game where it's at. But I I do believe, especially Dark Souls one, if you can take your time and learn and read patterns, you will absolutely succeed in this game. So, soapbox over. This, this makes why you get so tilted playing Overwatch makes so <laughs> much more sense to me, Andrew. Because as somebody who watches you get upset about things killing you that you can't yep. see, yeah. I I understand yep. it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely probably around Dark Souls two, three, like maybe before three came out, but around that era was when I think I started seeing things on YouTube that I was like, no, this, this game is more skill and art than it is just, Mm -hmm. you know, bullshittery. I mean, like, I really like, I like the concept of dark souls because I like a lot of retro games. I like bullet Mm -hmm. hell games. I like that sort of stuff. Um, I just don't like the RPG elements, but I agree with you too. I think it's, it's not just difficult to be difficult. There's substance cool. there. All right, let's talk about the Buckwild lore because the lore is Buckwild. Um, I'm going to split this up in a few parts. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of the backstory behind everything, the world, setting up the world. We're going to take a break. And then when we come back, um, I'm going to tell this uh, uh, the story in two parts. I'm going to tell the story how you would experience it playing and you're going to see, and then I'm going to tell you what's actually going on between, <laughs> behind, some, behind some of the scenes. And, nice. and I think it's going to be fun is the, there's the experience that everybody has, and then the experience that only you have when you go and search YouTube after playing the game. You're like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> you did what I did for the FNAF flavor text. I did. Uh, I this did. is the FNAF this style. Is, this is much like Elden Ring is the spiritual successor to Dark Souls. This is the spiritual successor to the FNAF flavor text. Oh, boy. Nice. All right. <clears throat> when the world began, ancient dragons ruled over the realm, and the world was gray and formless. There was no life, no death, just endless gray ruled by eternal dragons made of stone. But then fire <laughs> appeared, and everything changed. The fire the nation fire attacked, nation and everything right. changed. <laughs> now, fire in this context represents life and death. It's light, it's dark, time, chaos. It's, it's the world. Um, the first flame is what it's called, and the first flame would oppose the stagnation of the world. 
it doesn't really no one really knows where it came from or where it, you know where it where it originated but it, it showed up and its power drew in all of these primordial primordial beings these beings kind of melded together and evolved and changed and created these powerful energies called souls now a few of these primordial beings kind of like again merged together ate the other ones and used the souls to channel the flame's power into these like punched up versions called lord souls this gave these individual primordial beings basically the powers of a god this is dark souls creation myth essentially um now the gods that were formed were and and i'll, I'll note here i had the guys watch the opening cutscene to dark souls um, anybody who plays Dark Souls casually will see this cutscene, and every single person who watches that cutscene will say, "What the fuck? What, <laughs> what just yeah, happened? We all did that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's incredibly cryptic on purpose. Um, what it is doing, it is it's showing you the the ro the uh, rogues gallery who you're gonna fight. That's what that's really all you need to take. Mm -hmm. with. So Got the it. gods that were formed were Gwyn, who represented the Lord Soul of Light, Grave Lord Nito, who is that big hunk and massive skeleton. Uh, okay. who rep who represented the lord soul of death obvi and the witch of isolith who represented the lord soul of chaos these three beings would then go on to create the three major factions that will eventually rule over the world light death um, and chaos are there three like the 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 three genders okay. light death and chaos <laughs> <laughs> so separate from these three lords was the fourth and final lord soul being now this being very a mysterious one known only as the furtive pygmy um developed a unique lord soul that appears pl pitch black called the dark soul ding matt, uh, matt. he said the <laughs> name of the movie there we go um now the dark soul it's later revealed that this would act this would basically be the progenitor of humanity ah Lower lower age humanity and capital H humanity. Oh, okay. Um, now together, oh. so outside of the furtive pygmy, we'll we'll come back to him in about three hours. Um, together, <laughs> Gwyn, Gwyn, Nito, and the Witch of Isleth would harness their collective Lord Soul powers to overthrow the everlasting dragons and rule over the land. This is your um, your Zeus and Mount Olympus, basically. Um, and speaking of Zeus, uh, image one is Gwyn, god of the sun. He wields lightning bolts because he is Zeus. He's a he's a Zeus ass Zeus. Got it. Yep. He's a man, Zeus ass. He Zeus. sure man is. Kyle. With beard, power of man with sun. Beard. Cool. Yep. Um, we've got Grave Lord Nito in Image Two. He's that big old Matt hunk of skeleton. <laughs> Makes no sense. <laughs> I love Grave Lord Nito. Um, he he uses he has a his thing is like he creates this he like has this like blight this is like basically like death uh, death blow. And uh, he just commands skeletons. He's a necromancer. Um, and then we've got the Witch of Isolith, who is on image three. She shared her portion of her Lord Soul with her seven daughters. And together, they kind of crafted and wield the Flames of Chaos. Um, this Flame of Chaos, or this use of Flames of Chaos, would later be called Pyromancy. Ah, okay. okay. And that's image three. Andrew, this is just a joke for okay. you and I, but I actually really like the Witch of Isolith's chipped ham. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair there enough. it is. I like it. You can you can edit that out, Todd, but that's... Is that, that a was, regional, that a regional PA joke? It's, it's a regional dialect. Yeah, it's a Pittsburgh joke. So, yeah. Now, a big reason why this coordinated assault succeeded so well is because Gwyn had been working with a secret informant. Um, a fourth character called Seath the Scaleless. That's the big slimy white dragon. The blue eyes white dragon, if you will. So slimy. Uh, um, Seath the Scaleless betrayed the rest of his kind by informing Gwyn, like, oh, hey, guess what? Dragons can actually be killed. Uh, all you gotta do is rip off their stone scales because their scales are the source of their immortality. And you can do that with lightning. Um, and in image four, I don't have Seath the Scaleless. <laughs> Instead, I have the furtive pygmy. Because I could have rearranged this, but that ah, fuck it. Um, so, they, so Gwen's army, Nito, the witches of Islift, they all they killed off the everlasting dragons and secured their power over the world. And just like pantheons are wont to do, Gwyn and his people began right away rebuilding this new world in his image. This new world was called Lordran, and this would usher in the Age of Fire. Um, Gwyn and his family of gods ruled over everything from their lavish city of the gods they named Anorlando, which is your Mount Olympus. Mount Olympus. Uh, this is on image five. 
It's shiny. Yeah, it is shiny. It's very golden. It's. It I is. don't remember Orlando being that nice. <laughs> That's a good joke. Um. <laughs> so at this point, way way deep below the earth, Gwyn, excuse me, Gwyn had built this massive kiln to house the first flame, aka the source of his power and ultimately his rule. Um, Gwyn ruled for centuries in an era of prosperity um, while Nito went into slumber overseeing the dead deep within the catacombs and then the witches went their own way. They expanded their sprawling nation of Isolith deep underground and everyone was happy and nothing ever happened and it was all fine. Cool. So that's end uh, roll credits. Roll the credits. end. Andrew, question. I'm, I'm connecting dots here. So okay. three classes is night associated with Gwyn, thief associated with um the the grave lord and and pyromancers associated with the witch or am i, am I not reaching? quite okay. but there are you're 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 on the right track there are a lot of things in the game so there are factions in the game that you can join called covenants okay that give you locked that unlock certain skills and abilities and there are a lot of types of abilities in mat like there's um there's holy magic and lightning magic that is associated with Gwyn and Gwyn's knights. Gotcha. Every pyromancer is 100% associated with Isolith sure. and the descendants of the witches of Isolith. Um you could actually there is a there is a covenant called Grave Lord and oh. and covenants are mostly for multiplayer so actually I'll just talk about this real quick. Grave lording is a thing that you can do where like if you you have to find a certain coffin, and if you climb in the coffin and just sleep in the coffin, a big skeleton carries you down, and you just need to like talk to Grave Lord Nito before you're supposed to fight him, and he's just like, "What's up, dog?" And you can just like pledge your life to Grave Lord Nito, and then by doing so, you can invade other people. But instead of like you attacking them, you just send monsters to attack them. <laughs> oh, awesome! All right, it's, it's wild. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, anyway, so you're you're on the right track. Okay. Okay. Um, so obviously the getting was good until it wasn't, um, they, everybody must reap what they ultimately sow. And, uh, and, and what happened was the first flame began to diminish and give way to darkness, capital D darkness. Um, now facing an end to his empire, Grant Gwyn approached the witch of Isolith and her daughters to help him artificially reignite the first flame using their chaos flame. Um, the Witch of Isolith did so, and uh, unfortunately, the spell backfired pretty bad. Oh! And the 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 chaos flame engulfed the witch and reacted with her Lord Soul in this massive explosion of chaos flame. The resulting exploded f explosion flooded all of Isolith, warping the witch's daughters and the rest of Isolith's inhabitants into these mutilated Cronenberg-esque demons with a surprising taste for flesh. <laughs> Hmm. Oh, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> so, oh, dang. Yeah, Gwyn un un accidentally unleashed a demon army. Whoops. Uh, Oops. Realizing he done fucked up, Gwyn, <laughs> then sent, <laughs> Gwyn then sent a squad of Black Ops-esque knights clad in this silver armor down to Isolith to deal with the demon threat. They did not succeed. So, facing an impending demon invasion, Gwyn had no choice but to journey to the kiln himself and try to reignite the flame. Before he left, Gwyn divided out, divided out fragments of his power to his children to rule over Anne Orlando in his absence. Um, he also div divvied out his power to Seath the Scalus. Remember the, uh, the albino dragon, the slimy the, dragon? The, in the, the smooth boy. The sticky dragon. The smooth boy. The sticky dragon. Um, yeah. In return for Seath's assistance in overthrowing the dragons. And also to a group of four unnamed kings, uh, later found out to be human kings, who ruled over a nearby city-state named New Londo. We'll get to them later. Um, Gwyn then left for the Kiln to feed the flame and never returned. And this uh, is a picture of Seath the Scalus here. He looks less sticky here. He's less sticky here. This is where you fight him as a boss. Gotcha. He's, yeah, more, the, uh, he's more shiny and less sticky. In the video, very sticky. <laughs> he's he's sticky because he's, he's covered in the blood of his brothers. Hmm. Who he betrayed. I see. I, uh, I yeah. can see how that would make one sticky then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Okay. So following Gwyn's departure, Lord Dren began to decay. Um, a, and this was mostly brought on by a plague. 
This plague hit the inhabitants of Lordran one by one, which was a plague of undeath. More and more people every day were getting cursed with being undead. And that curse was marked by a symbol of a flaming ring called the dark sign. That's image seven. Okay, question for you, Andrew. Yeah. You said that people are becoming undead. Correct. So are these dead people coming back to life or are these live people dying and then becoming zombies quickly? Actually, really good question. It is the latter. So dead and huh. undead are very different things in this universe. Okay. Um, undead means that you literally can't die. You are, you are a mindless husk trapped forever. Um, and it's kind of like trapped between reality and, and nightmares, basically. Yeah, sure. D being dead, getting to die is a... A blessing at this luxury, point. Luxury, <laughs> a, a blessing, yeah. <laughs> Your soul is actually laid to rest and you, you can, you know, it, you can go to eternal slumber. This is not death in the sense of like Western Christianity death. Like, yeah. you know, like hell going to hell. This is death and like you travel the river Styx and you go to Hades and you're just like, you're done. <laughs> Your soul gets <laughs> yeah. filed away. <laughs> um, so undeath is a very like bad thing because you're just trapped in this repeat cyclic cyclical hellhole, if you will. Um, now, anyone who had the dark sign, like I said, would not die by traditional means. Instead, they were cursed to forever reanimate at a bonfire. Uh, which are concentrated points of the first flame's power, basically linking all of these undead to the power of the first flame. So they can die, technically. Like, you can stab an undead and they die, but they just, like, pop up at a bonfire. Which is a really fun way to make a turn a story into a video game mechanic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, now, each time a cursed undead dies and is reborn... While they're still reborn, they lose a, a part of themselves until there's nothing left but a mindless husk, mostly a zombie. This is called hollowing. Pretty good term for it. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, there, those on the verge Holloway, of hollowing will seek out a type of black-colored soul named capital H Humanity. So humanity is what reverses hollowing. It undoes the hot dog skin. That is the, the video game mechanic is... Me turning hot dog skin into normal people skin, but lore wise, mm. yes, people. <laughs> there, this is a curse that has affected this entire world, and people are searching for their humanity, their purpose, their life. That's what hollowing is. It's it's basically they are they have lost their identity, their sense of self, their purpose, and they're driven insane and turn into mindless zombies. And you said humanity is like a specific flavor of soul. It is. So image eight <laughs> is the game icon of humanity. So it is. It literally appears as this like ah. black black flame. Ah. And that, that's like the Baja blast. It's the Baja blast of of souls. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if normal souls are code red, then this is Baja <laughs> blast. <laughs> um. Yeah. So pretty fucked up. So the anybody else who wasn't undead feared the curse and as those people tend to do they built a church yeah Yay. yeah um they built a church that was specifically designed to purge anyone unlucky enough to be cursed with undeath um the church summarily executed thousands of undead um where they could and then built prisons to house the rest as they are wont to do okay anyway as <laughs> as the as the years <laughs> went on a mysterious prophecy made its way through the ranks of the undead who at this point basically a race of people. Yeah. Um and this this prophecy was called the undead pilgrimage. It states that at the very end of the age of fire, a chosen undead would one day journey to the heart of Lordron, the the realm of the kings or the realm of the gods and usher in a new age by ringing the bells of awakening. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let me guess how the game ahead, ends. Kyle. Uh, not it ends. That's only the first half, of the first third of the game. Oh wow! Okay, mm. never mind then. But that's an awesome segue because that takes us right to the beginning of the game, where an unnamed undead awakens inside of a prison cell. Ah, uh, uh, as most good stories start. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yep. That's me. Bet you're wondering how I got it. <laughs> <in. laughs> 
Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how, again, how Dark Souls sell, tells a story because we're not going to be able to experience this in necessarily a linear flow. I'm going to get you the beats. I'm going to give you the beats, but I want to tell you a fun little anecdote of how things work. And the reason why when most people play this game, they're like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> um, and this all goes back to, remember I was talking about Miyazaki and his whole thing about like, you know, he was reading fragments of, of text and kind of just pieced together these things. And, you know, um, this is very intentional. This is very intentional. Um, there are honestly maybe two or three points in this entire game where someone explicitly like sits you down and tells you something in detail. <laughs> hey, this is what happened. Yeah, nice. and yeah. I think two of those three are they're lying. <laughs> so <laughs> most of the major events of the story, when you're playing, you are walking through a ruined world. Everything that has happened to this world has already happened. So it's 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 less of like it's less of like a Final Fantasy where you're you know you're going from cutscene to cutscene like you're the center of the action, you're the savior. Mm -hmm. It's more like you're taking a really bummer Disneyland ride through a bunch of ruins. <laughs> awesome <laughs> yeah and you're and you're getting and, and through this like if you take the time to like look around and read item descript descriptions and do all these things you can kind of start to piece together these little like mini stories you know like well why is that arc why is that statue of that person sitting over there why is this enemy sitting right here if they come from this other direction you know everything it's, is very intentional it's all the coolest parts of like fallout 3 in new vegas yeah where, yeah like, mm -hmm. i stumble yeah. yeah. upon a, a thing that lore yeah yeah i think that's a good way to put it um that a lot of that lore is also relegated to like i said text description so every item and piece of equipment has some flavor text thing um <laughs> on it. Uh -huh. and and a lot of the lore comes from piecing parts those pieces together like a puzzle basically um so i want to show i want to give you an example of how to tell these stories through the story of havel the rock which is image nine. Havel the Rock Johnson. Havel the Rock mm -hmm. Johnson. Now, on the surface, Havel the Rock is just some dude that you find hidden inside the bottom of a watchtower in one of the early sections of the game. You can fight him if you happen to find some specific key, and he drops a rare ring. He is this game's version of a mini boss, where he's stronger than a normal enemy, he's got unique drops, but he's not big enough to warrant a title card. For example, um, taking it taking it face value, he's just a big dude with a silly looking club, right? Yep. Okay. Um, now, like I said, killing him drops Havel's ring, which mechanically allows you to carry double your equipment load. But by reading the description, you learn that Havel was a high ranking knight in Gwyn's army and one of his most trusted advisors. The silly club that he wields is actually the tooth of an ancient dragon that he slaughtered, which oh. is pretty cool. Yeah, neat. Um, and that bulky armor that he wears that just kind of looks like literal stone, it's because it's literal stone scales from those same everlasting dragons. Oh, nice. Yeah, pretty oh. fucking rad. Um, and at some point, Havel was locked inside this watchtower, and the items literally says, for his own good, um, probably for fear of him hollowing out and going on a murderous rampage because he wields a literal dragon's tooth as a club. Right? Yeah. Except... It's a fair concern Except, to have. Except, later on in the game, you find some more items that then recontextualize this. Again, 30 hours later. Um, a description on a spell found in a very late game area notes that Havel hated Seath the Scaleless, the sticky dragon, um, and very, very openly disagreed with Gwyn granting Seath part of his Lord Soul power. He's basically like, this guy's no good. If you mm -hmm. give him this power, like this will fuck things up. Um, and we learned this from other things, other item descriptions, that Seath was into some real twisted shit. Um, Seath is the, is the court-mandated black science uh, figure in this uh, story. Um, hmm. So a lot of, yeah, a okay. lot of uh, kidnapping maidens and, and terrible experiments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and Havel knew all this stuff and was like, you know, Havel being like a pretty good guy was like, this, is a, this guy is bad news, we can't do this. Um, and no one listened to him. And there's one last clue to Havel's backstory found uh, when you go to Anne Orlando. Spoiler alert, we're going to go to Anne Orlando, that golden city. Um, you, If you strike a certain wall, uh, you will dispel <laughs> an illusion. That's right. This game is riddled with fake walls that you just have to hit to reveal. To you just got to awesome. know where they are. 
Yep. Uh, you reveal a hidden treasure room. That treasure room contains Havel's actual stone armor along with an item called an occult club, which is just like a type of damage, like necrotic damage in mm. D&D. Um, but the item description on the occult club says this has the power to kill a god. Also, image 10 is an image of a mimic. I want you guys just to take that in. Great. Oh, it's got legs. I didn't <laughs> it's, see a, the legs. it's a good and a big old design. design. Yeah. yeah. It's a good mimic design. Uh, so that if, is you, a good if mimic. you open a treasure chest and it happens to be a mimic, the mimic eat, devours you whole. Um, ah. But but the, the point of the story is this occult club was hidden within an illusory wall within, within a mimic tr treasure chest. But this was like Set, set by Havel's armor, so clearly, like this was Havel's, and he was. I think if you put all these clues together, you can surmise the story of Havel the Knight is a lot different, a lot more complicated. Um, so kind of like to tell the story a different way, Havel vehemently disagreed with Gwyn granting Seath dukedom in his empire, and so after unsuccessfully trying to convince him otherwise, Havel secretly acquired a forbidden weapon to assassinate Gwyn, the Cold Club. But uh -oh. Gwyn probably found out some along along the way and had Havel arrested and thrown into this shitty makeshift prison in a watchtower where Havel just like was left to die, hollowed and went crazy until you just like kick down the door and murder him. Interesting. Nice. Okay, I like that. Wow. Yeah. So that's that's storytelling yeah. in Dark Souls. That's why a lot of times you people will play and be like, who the fuck was that guy? Why does that even matter? <laughs> You that, will oftentimes not know what's going on until after the fact. <laughs> that is very similar to how um, Magic the Gathering told its story for hmm. until the yeah. it, until like social media gave them a way to like reach yeah. out their fans. But it was like we got to tell we have a story to tell. The only way the only pieces we can do that are randomized cards in a booster pack. Um, so yeah, you got you got. <laughs> right. Bits yeah. and pieces of lore and like one it, paragraph of a time, one, yep, one, yep. two, one, two or three sentences at a time. Yeah. 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 See all those similarities that you're drawing between magic and FNAF, Kyle. So everybody, we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we come back, I'm going to go through some of the major, the beats of the actual story, the journey of the chosen undead. And then. The probably the most exciting part. I'm going to talk about some of my favorite NPCs and most notorious bosses. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Aubrey. I'm Dennis. And I'm Johnny. Every other Tuesday, we take an in-depth and humorous look at different comic books. We're talking indie comics, capes and cowls, and everything in between. Graphic Novel Explorers Club is available on all platforms. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to tell your friends, if you have any. All right, we're back. Uh, so we're going to go through a couple more things. Um, first, I'm going to go through the journey of the chosen undead, which is basically the major story. Beat. So if you're going to play this game casually, casually, this is pretty much everything that you would see without a lot of the context. Okay, so we begin the game lying in a cell inside the undead asylum, a grim prison built on an isolated island, clearly intended to prevent any escape. We look up to see this mysterious knight dropping a key inside our cell, which allows us to escape. We fight our way through the wandering prisoners and guards, all whom have gone way past hollowing at this point, uh, which was actually the image that you put of the uh, shriveled man. That's one of the oh. hollowed prisoners. So that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we eventually me. meet up with huh. the mysterious knight. Yeah, uh, this mysterious knight who now appears to be fatally wounded. Um, he introduces himself as Oscar of Astora, and he tells us about the prophecy of the undead, which, as I said, um, the unchosen undead will rise above and bring about a new age, travel to Lordron, and seek the Bells of Awakening. Yada, yada, yada. Um, Oscar also hands us his Estus Flask, which is a magical item crafted from the very bonfires that the undead are bound to, which is why, why Estus Flask act as your like primary healing. It's your, your, your Sunny D. People call it Sunny D. Hmm. Um, <laughs> because it's like gold. Um, well, and, it's powered uh, this by direct the sun. Yeah. And it's powered by the sun. Um, and so Oscar directs us to carry on the pilgrimage in his stead. Um, he directs us to basically the exit and says, go ring the bells. And so we do. Uh, we dip out of the asylum and we find our way to the edge of a cliff where a giant crow conveniently picks us up and carries us to Lordron. 
I have no idea why this happens. It just does. Nobody knows, and it's super cool. And I included a video. You can watch it here if you want. It's just a big ass crow just kind of scoops you up <laughs> and takes you to Lordron. <laughs> Uh, so after the the crow scoops you, he drops you in Firelink Shrine, which is this game's hub. This is our Peach's castle, our Gruntilda's mm-hmm. castle, uh, and and really like this acts as the the one and only safe haven. So you can do all your shopping here, meet your NPCs, whatever. Um, here we meet our very first non-hostile NPC, which is a sh- a soldier wearing chainmail who goes only by the name Crestfallen Warrior. And this man is on image 11. Now, Crestfallen is just that. He's a Crestfallen warrior, a nameless undead who had journeyed to Lordron, just like everyone else, to complete the pilgrimage. Because here's the thing. Undead have nothing else to do but mm-hmm. do the but, undead pilgrimage. But a pilgrimage. It's either that or die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, give, it gives them purpose. Yeah, right. Um, and Crestfallen uh, got scared and just gave up. And now he's just like hanging here by the bonfire waiting to die. Um. He points us generally in the direction of the two bells and says, okay, go up to the top of the undead parish. It's this big castle all the way up in the mountain and then all the way below ground through the poisonous swamp of Blight Town. When we hear that, we have no idea what any of that means, but we (laughs) say, okay, and we go forward because that's the one thing we do in Dark Souls is we keep moving forward. Um, One thing about Crestfallen Warrior that I think is really fun is there's a lot of speculation that Crestfallen Warrior represents everybody who's given up Dark Souls. Mm -hmm. That's really oh, funny. I yeah, like nice. that. That is yeah. really funny. It, yeah, it's it's that's the you become he is the he is the embodiment of somebody who played the game once and was like, nah, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> huh. This is very fun. Uh so to get to the first spell, we traverse through this medieval era village, um, and then through a massive church on top of a hill surrounded by like castle walls. Um the church is riddled with undead villagers and soldiers. We get to the top of the church and we ice two sentient gargoyles. Do you remember in our Elden Ring episode, I talked about the bell gargoyles? Yeah. Yeah, Kyle does. I sure so do. So this is, there's a there's a boss fight at the top of this church. Um, you're attacked by two gargoyles. And that, um, when Kyle talked about the gargoyles from Elden Ring in our Elden Ring ah, episode. that's right. That, mm-hmm. that was what this is iterating off of. Nice. Um, yeah, so we, we ice the two gargoyles throw box baby um we ice the two gargoyles and we ring the bell and are rewarded with a nice aerial view view of the the land of lordron um now for the second bell it's a lot farther away we have to journey through the court mandated sewer level capital s <laughs> capital l sewer level um and get to the underground shanty town of blight town which is one of probably more the more notorious uh areas of dark souls um it's this like kind of you're on this like large rickety wooden structure that literally sways back and forth it's built into this cliff side and you have to like traverse these narrow paths where where all of these ogres are chasing you with spiked clubs and mushroom mu- mutants are shooting uh poison darts at you oh hate it when that happens i know that was a lot to unpack so i'll give you a minute to digest that (laughs) um and then when you finally make your way down to all of the rickety wood structures you enter the poisonous swamp and it's just a large swamp that makes you run real slow and constantly drain your health (laughs) and it fucking sucks awesome (laughs) yeah um so we we make it to the other side of the swamp and we enter a large cave on the opposite end to find one of the daughters of isolith and we're going to talk about her in a little bit later um, we we kill her because we don't know who she is at this point, and uh, we find behind her chamber is the second bell, and we ring it, and a cutscene shows this huge gate opening, um, uh, opening this door, this kind of fortress um, right outside of the undead parish. That well, sounds great so far. Yeah, everything's everything's good. We're yeah, just going it's on all, a fun little all adventure. great. Yeah, just yeah. ringing bells, snapping necks. Yeah. Uh, so we head all the way back up to Firelink Shrine. Um, where a large serpent with this kind of like monster goat face is just waiting for us in Firelink Shrine, and he's image twelve. Cool. Oh, Andrew, how many times? How many times oh. approximately have I died at this point? <laughs> a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> um, this atrocity is King Seeker Framped. Um, King Seeker Framped. <laughs> 
speaks like this. And he also, he also like moves his jaw like a goat would. He's like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and he like, he clicks, his jaw clicks when he talks. It's very unsettling. Looking um, up King Seeker. Frampt YouTube yeah. right now. So Fram Frampt inf informs us that we are the chosen. This is talking to the King of Hyrule. Uh, Frampt tells us that we are the chosen undead. Yeah. We are fated to succeed Gwyn as the next great lord. Um, and in order to do so, we must relink, relink the first flame, which will finally undo the undead curse. And let me be clear, up until this point, we've only been hyper-focused on ringing up a couple bells. Right? Like, we had no idea what those bells would do. It was just like, someone told us to ring a bell, so we rang and a we, bell. And we rang the bells. We sure rang those bells, baby. Um, so now, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, shit, we're the chosen one. We gotta, we're going to succeed Gwyn, the god of the sun. Um, in order to in order to save the world, we have to go to the go to the first flame and relink it, basically. So that's our that's our mission. We do that. Um, so in order to do that, well, let me back up. To do this, he says that we need to journey to An Orlando, which is the city of the gods that I mentioned, um, and we have to collect the Lord vessel. Um, the Lord vessel will allow us access to the kiln of the first flame. Cool. So we do that. Okay. Okay. Um, Great. The Love gate it. that we opened was to an area called Sen's Fortress, um, which is just a just a veritable fun house of booby traps, giant swinging axes, and Raiders of the Lost Ark ass rolling boulders. <laughs> <laughs> just a just a maze of maze of sadness. Um, and at the top of Sen's Fortress, uh, these two terrifying bat monsters speared us away to the city of the gods and Orlando. And waiting inside the central building of this golden city is Princess Guinevere, Gwyn's eldest daughter and last remaining not insane occupant of Anor <laughs> And she's, hmm. she's shown on image 13. And, I, and I'll tell you, the image that I picked specifically is to show the scale of big, you, a man. A small lady. dog man. <laughs> yeah, big lady. Big, big lady Dim yeah. Dim 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 Dimitrescu. Dimitrescu. <laughs> So Big Lady Guinevere gives us the Lord Vessel and tells us, uh, reinforces that our mission is to succeed her father to save this dying world from the darkness. Um, and we're told that we're basically set off on the second half of the game at this point. We have to now hunt down the four remaining Lord Souls. Remember the, the, all the videos, the mm -hmm. cuts in the intro, yeah, intro cutscene? Yeah. Our, our rogues gallery? Here we are. <laughs> yep. So here, here's our yeah. lieutenant. So we got to hunt down the four remaining Lord Souls and return them to the kiln of the first flame. Now we can tackle these in any order. Um, so I'll just, for the sake of going through the story, um, the way that I did it is I went to Duke's archives first and I confronted Seat the Scaleless, deep hidden, deep within a cavern, uh, hidden behind a secret chamber of his massive library. Um, after that, uh, we can go to the catacombs, which are located directly under Firelink Shrine, and we fight a horde of skeletons and necromancers uh, to gain access to the Tomb of the Giants, which is kind of a, a another level, a deeper level um, under the catacombs. There we find the slumbering Nito, um, who, if we didn't already pledge fealty to him, uh, we fight him. <laughs> and uh, he calls upon the hordes of the dead to protect himself, but we just... we. Clash right through those skeletons, and we we ice Nito. Can we clap um, them skeleton cheeks? That's right. That's right. Um, one note: um, <laughs> this game does really fun things with skeletons. Um, in there's a there's a particular there's a particular like staged uh, encounter at the bottom of the catacombs. There's a lot of like tricky platforming and just like really harrowing like like light bridges and things. But you finally like make it all the way to the bottom of the catacombs. And you're in this like pitch black darkness, and you just hear, <laughs> and all of a sudden, skeletons, like literally on wheels of bones, like Sonic dashing around the floor, just <laughs> awesome. come and charge you. Um, they're called bone wheel skeletons, and they're <laughs> hysterical. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and they just like they literally like they they're skeletons that are nailed to we wooden wheels that are spikes all around and they just roll around <laughs> and crash into you. Great. <laughs> there's, so there's Andrew, so much like silly shit. I love that. So can you yeah. pledge fealty to any of the lords or is it just um uh just the, just Nito because he has Nito. that covenant 
Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Because Nito is kind of like a Hades where he's not evil. He's not like, sure. Again, he's not Satan. He's just like, he just he's owns the death. dead. And he's yeah. very much like, I want nothing to do with any of this. I just want to chill in the catacombs. Um, gotcha. You have to kill him because you need his Lord soul, but you can first pledge fealty to him if you want. <laughs> the The thing about covenants is it has no actual mechanic. Like there's no actual game mechanic. It's just for fun. <laughs> it's just for fun. Mm. I see. I see. Yeah, you you some of them you unlock like a couple spells, but they're they're way too expensive to be useful. Gotcha. Mm. Um, yeah. Anyway, sure. so uh, actually, well, I take that back because the one you get from Nito is what speedrunners use, but it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> so we we then return to the poison swamp. Remember the poison swamp, mm-hmm. and uh, we go past that bell chamber into the section of the land ruled by demons. This is Isleth, or what's now called Lost Isleth. Um, this has been overtaken by the demon horde. Um, at the center of Isleth since the, sits the mutilated bed of chaos, the source of the chaos flame that took over the witch's lord soul. And that's image 14. Just looks like a big old tree. Yeah. 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 And that's, and sure that's, the, that's the really cool thing. So the imagery of the chaos is roots. It's these just wild roots that spread everywhere. And like, if you have property, you know that roots and weeds <laughs> will literally invade anything and they grow <laughs> everywhere right so that's kind of the idea is that like when you're traveling through isolith it's just all flames and these like massive tree roots that are just covering the world um it's really cool imagery and yeah the witch of isolith just turned into a big old tree hmm. okay all right She's a, that's a flaming very, deku tree if you will that's very um game of thrones too like with the yes. three-eyed raven and yes. stuff yeah yep yep very much that that is constantly what i was thinking of in, in that part of game of thrones nice um finally we journey to the ruins of new londo um this was a city that was sealed and flooded and we'll talk about this here in a bit um to contain an ancient evil as we, we don't really learn much about it um at surface level we open the floodgates and we drain the city um, which allows us to traverse the super scary abyss which is the source of capital d darkness um in order to take out the mysterious four kings of new londo in their image 15. Um, what, am, and that, what am I looking at? <laughs> yeah, they're... Yeah, same fair, question. Fair question. Um, it's... They're very... Um, they're like the Nazgul. Surreal. Yeah, they're okay. kind of Nazgul-y. They don't... They're, they're very formless on purpose. Like, they don't have faces. They're just... There's a lot of things in this game that is purposefully obscured. Okay. Um, so, like, a lot of things just don't have clear faces. There's a lot of, like swirling fuzziness and and the four kings are a great example of that they're just kind of like just kind of spiky particle effects <laughs> um yeah okay and and in there so this the boss fight the four kings is you're just in this completely like black void and uh in this black void in the deep of deep deep of the abyss we meet a second goat serpent who looks just like king seeker framed but this one uh introduces himself as dark stalker koth and he tells us a slightly different story. So he tells us that the big scary darkness that Gwyn has been fearing this whole time is not actually so big and scary. Rather, just like fire represented change in the age of the dragons, the darkness represents change in the age of the fire. Um, the darkness is the, the change that this world needs. It's the next cycle. Um, this is, in, so it, Instead of like, just like the fire, you know, ended the stagnation, the darkness can end the stagnation of the age of fire. Um, he tells us also, we have the power to end the cycle and usher in a new age of darkness. After all, dark is the source of humanity because oh. dark is connected to the yeah. dark soul, which is connected to the furtive pygmy, which is the progenitor of, of humanity. Huh. Um, and this is where the lore gets a little bit fuzzy. It's actually later in the dlc they basically specify that the furtive pygmy is the progenitor of hum- humanity and undead is the curse of humanity so and this is this is a little bit kind of i'm going back and forth here but at this point we don't know this um <laughs> anyway uh so Koth tells us we can uh, all we have to do is just get kill gwen get to the killing of the first flame walk away that's all we have to do and we will become the dark lord basically the little order of the dark okay cool. Man, so that's it yeah <laughs> yeah so uh we return to firelink shrine all four lord souls intact 
Um, and then Framp e Frampt escorts us down to the kiln of the first flame. We head inside to find a very frail man wielding a flaming saber and yelling uncontrollably. This is Gwyn, the mighty god of gods, who at this point has given every shred of his power and has just become a complete husk. Um, he is in image 16. And I also put in a YouTube clip here. Um, one of probably the most iconic music track from this game is the, the music behind the Gwyn boss fight, the final boss fight. Um, the reason why it's such a big deal is until this point, the music of Dark Souls is very atmospheric until you hit a boss. And the music and the bosses is all very bombastic. It's very Lord of the Rings cinematic. Like, ha, mm -hmm. ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, but then when you get to Gwyn, <laughs> this character that you've been hearing about for the entire game, the, the probably most important person in this universe, this larger-than-life figure who you're supposed to be replacing, you finally get to him, and he is the size of you. He is just a man, and he is... He looks like another hot dog man. And this music plays where it's like this really sad minor key piano song. And it's like, yeah. Da, 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 da. It's very sad, very sad. Very, mel very melancholy. Yeah, I'm listening to it. Yeah. yeah. And, and while all the while, where this band is just like babbling, <laughs> just like, <"Rah!" laughs> like, just charging like uncontrollably with this flaming sword. Um, it's pretty wild. It's it's a it, it's a very interesting boss fight for a game that so much indexed on its big cinematic boss fights. To to make the final boss just like a man was a really really interesting move and and, and a real cool storytelling mechanic. Yeah. Hmm. So again, playing this casually, you're like. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna we, stomp this man right now. Yeah, you, so yeah. We, we kill him because we're the hero of the story, and and this is where we make the decision: either go with King Seeker Frampt and relink the flame to prolong the Age of Fire, or turn away, go with Darkstalker Koth to and usher in a new Age of Darkness. I don't like that I have to ally myself with the ghost face snakes. You have to ally yourself with one of the two goat face snakes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you guys what do you guys think? What do you guys think you would do? I'll I tell like you what I did. I like the name King Seeker yeah. better than Dark Bringer or whatever. Dark Star. I I'm kind of compelled to usher in an age a new age of darkness personally. Yeah. Based on what you've told us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. After everything you said, it seems like seems like that's where we're going. Yeah. Seems like it would be a shame for me, a singular old person, to prevent <laughs> the entire culture from moving forward into a modern age, Andrew. That's what I thought too, which is why I also went which is why I went with the uh, the age of dark. Okay, so that's that's on the surface level Dark Souls. Um, if you were playing this and you just played through the game, that's that's probably what you would glean. Maybe a couple pieces here and there, but like without going through and rewatching the whole thing, going and watching a bunch of YouTube videos and trying to piece things together, it's just really hard to to pick this apart in one go through. Um, so you're probably sitting and being like, "Okay, that was really cool, but like, what the fuck?" <laughs> um, so yeah. I'm not gonna get through to to go through every little bit and piece here. Would that would be an entire podcast? And there are podcasts that do that. I'm not going to do that. But I am gonna tell you some of my favorite stories and some, talk about some of my more favorite like NPC quest lines and stories behind some of the more no notable bosses. And I think you'll get a better sense of what this world actually is. Okay, so. Let's first talk about a man named Solaire of Astora. So we first meet Solaire after taking out the boss of the Undead Berg, which is kind of like the, the world 1-1 one, one of Dark Souls. Um, we see after, you know, coming, like, we've, we've triumphed over this, this great obstacle. We've never done a Dark Souls boss before. Like, this is our first one. So we're, like, riding high on, on those, those fumes. And we, we come across this man in chainmail that's decorated with this like really cool looking sun symbol. And he's standing on the side of a castle wall. He's just looking out into the distance. And there's a there's like an, a you know a sunrise coming up through the clouds. This is image 17. Um now what sets Solaire apart is at this point, 
he is, you know, maybe the third or fourth not hostile person that we've just seen entirely. And absolutely the first that doesn't seem 100% shady. Um, Dark Souls NPCs have a tendency to laugh uh, very uh, evil, very venomously Unsettle- every time they give you information. Yeah. Yeah. There's mm. a lot of like, <laughs> there's a lot of that. Um, and, and Solaire is just like totally chill. He's like, oh, hey, how's it going, friend? Um, he says like he, he too is undead, but he's just like, it's fine. Um, he says he's here in Lordron looking for his very own son. S-U-N. He's look. I'm looking for my son. Um, and he says, you know, I don't really know what that means yet, but gosh darn it, I know I'll know when I find it. You know, just just a just a chill dude. Um, he says to like, hey, this is like this is a pretty shitty world. Um, do you want to like hang out? <laughs> He's literally like, <laughs> all right, you, you know, you need friends in this world. <laughs> Let me be your friend. And uh, he says like, why don't you? He so he gives you an item called a white sign stope stone. And in the game, this is the item that allows you to summon in other people to help you defeat bosses and oh, also okay. leave your summon sign to let other people summon you in. And he says, look, like, this world's this world's a nightmare. You need some friends to go along. So how about we engage in some jolly cooperation? <laughs> um, and that's that's where that scene comes from. So we uh, so the way that NPC quests work is, um, you may have heard me talk about this in Elden Ring, but... Basically, like you meet up with people in random spots, and then there are triggers that have to happen for them to appear in later spots. And what makes these quest lines really hard is you never know where they're going to be in, until you like, unless you're following a guide. Um, and you don't always know what the recs, the rec, the requirements are. Like you, you might need like a certain stat, or you might need to do a certain thing. And these games aren't entirely linear, so you could do things out of order and just like enti- and miss entire quest lines because you. You didn't go to that one place at that one time. So yeah. quest lines are are known to be like pretty fucky unless you're following a guide. Um, so I'm going to go through his quest line. Um, so we see Solaire later in, in Orlando. He's sitting at a bonfire. He's just hanging out. Um, he says, hey, don't forget, like you can summon people. Also, you can summon me. And this is the game telling you, hey, if you don't want to work with play with other people, that's fine. You can also summon in NPCs. So you can summon in Solaire to fight for you, fight with you. And you can just like literally just hang out with your best bud, Solaire, go fight um, the, the boss. And, and this comes because, very specifically because this happens to be right before a boss named Ornstein and Smo, which is a huge wall for news players, which we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. It's also my favorite law firm. I've made this joke. I've used this joke <laughs> format a lot tonight, but yeah. whatever. This is, the, this is the mechanic that... Uh, that Elden Ring people summon in their jellyfish bro. So that is kind of a an uh, an improve. That is a, a different advancement to that. Sure. So what Elden Ring did is they added in like actual bell. summon items, like offline summons. You can mm-hmm. still summon in NPCs and other people. Um, this the guy that that kills Millennia, the you let me solo her. Mm-hmm. That's an yeah. example of like summoning in other people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. But but yes, yeah. you're right. It's the same idea. Um. Okay. So. Uh, later on, we we wave b- b- uh, goodbye to Solaire. Um, later on, in the back half, after we get the Lord Vessel, um, if we meet, if you meet a certain, this is where like if your holy, or your faith happens to be X number of of numbers, whatever, you can see you can meet up with Solaire near this memorial, uh, right outside where we first met him out uh, in the Undead Parish. Um, Solaire invites us to join his covenant. The Warriors of Sunlight, aka the Sun Bros. And this is uh, image cool. 18 is Solaire doing the Praise the Sun. So this is where Praise the Sun comes from. Is yeah. that is uh when you meet when you meet Solaire, he um emotes are also a thing because there's social aspects to this. So Solaire gives you the Praise the Sun emote. And that's where Praise the Sun comes from. Gotcha. Great. Gotcha. Yep. Um so yeah, so we can check that box. Um Solaire then de- oh and, and Sun Broing is a version of cooperation where you can uh you ha- you get like a golden soapstone sign, and you get like certain like covenant items and other abilities for doing it. It's 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 made for like if you really want to focus on lightning damage, you can sunbro a bunch and get lightning spells or whatever. Doesn't matter. Anyway, um, Solaire divulges a little bit more about his backstory to us. So he says that uh, unfortunately he was unable to find his son in either Anor Orlando or Blight Town. He's kind of running out of options, and he's like, I don't know what to do. Like I haven't found my son yet. I'm I'm really like. I'm 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 worried. 
Um, he says that he actually became undead on purpose as a way to like make this journey. So like he 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 didn't he wasn't born undead. He like made himself that way so that he oh. could go on this pilgrimage and find his son, which I think is really interesting, um, given that this is such a curse. Can people be born undead? Unclear. Okay. I mean it, that that's the thing. There's a lot of muddiness. the The suggestion is that the undead are what happened to humanity. So sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, he's like, he starts to second guess himself. He's like, no, this is the path I've chosen. Like, it's going to be fine. He laughs it off. Um, he says, you know, maybe I'll go to Lost Isleth or something else. But we, we see him again um, in between. There's, there's two areas called the Demon Ruins and Lost Isleth. Kind of like the outskirts of, of Isleth is like where all the demons are. And then inner, inner Isleth is called Lost Isleth in the game. So in between those two zones, we see, we run into Slayer again. This time he's... It's kind of a wreck. Um, he's just like, I. Where is it? I haven't. I have. I've gone everywhere. I can't. I can't find it. Why am I here? Um, he doesn't even acknowledge that we're there. We're like, Slayer, my my dude. Like, it's gonna be okay. Let's just hang out. Um, and then we see him one, once more later on. Later down the line, in the center of Lost Isleth, um, he appears and says nothing, and he just straight up attacks us. Oh, um, bummer. Well, Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, it really sucks because he just like he just runs at you, and you're like, what the, what the fuck? He's also he's his head is covered in this like six legged parasite maggot thing. Um, it looks like a, a like a like a head crawler from uh, Half Life, mm. or a head crab, um, and uh, he's just like ranting. He's like, I found it, I found my son, ah! And uh, you you attack him, you fight him because it's all you can do, and uh, you kill him, and uh, you hear. You, uh, we have no choice but to kill him, and we hear his last words. My son, it's setting. It's dark, so dark. And uh, we kill him. Um, we get his armor and also a helmet titled the Sunlight Maggot, which the item description describes it as a parasite creature that uh, shows a brilliant light for anyone that it like grabs onto. So what happened was Solaire got attacked by this sunlight maggot in his mm -hmm. disparity and he completely like that brilliant light just like sapped him of his remaining humanity mm -hmm. and he just hollowed out went nuts thinking that he had found his son and uh mm. he got he had to kill him and that's what happens to our best friend Solaire. well Bummer. i'm sad now yeah yeah yeah, but, yeah here but, i am yeah, looking for good vibes out of sad. this game not <laughs> not not a single good vibe to be found it's all bad everything is bad um <laughs> Interesting note, there is a good there is a good ending to Solaire's quest. There's a good vibe to be found. There is a good vibe to be found. This is one of the few <laughs> where you can actually save Solaire from his fate. Um there's like a really weird way of sequence breaking. It's totally part of the game. It's not like a glitch or anything. But if you like get a bunch of humanity, which again is like really hard to get, you have to just farm rats forever. But if you get a bunch of humanity, go into the woods you can and kill go, boars. You kill boars. You go into the woods and kill and kill boars. You find like a hidden room outside of the the second bell area, right outside of the demon runes, and you can um, pay pay this humanity to this character. We'll talk about in a little bit, and they open a secret door that basically like allows you to go to Isolith early. If you do that, you can kill all the maggots so that when Solaire goes there, he never encounters oh. those maggots. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really cool. Huh. And and if you do all those things, you can actually summon Solaire as an NPC for the final bo boss fight against Gwen, which is pretty neat. That is hmm. that is neat. Oh, that is neat. Into that. I absolutely did that. Yeah. I, that was like an entire like second playthrough I did that. <laughs> so that's that's Solaire. Um let's talk another another favorite character, Siegmeier of Katarina. So we first meet Siegmeier the Onion Knight. Uh, who's sitting forlornly outside of the closed gate to Sen's fortress outside of the, the Undead Parish. Um, in image 19, he kind of looks like Winnie the Pooh to me in this yeah, picture. He yeah, looks, he looks like he's saying, yeah, he oh, does. bother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his, his voice is, hello, I am Sigmaya of Katarina. Hello, how are you? <laughs> like he's, he's got like a Santa Claus energy about him. Um, and for listeners, if you aren't looking at the image, um, he is... Uh, in full head to toe armor, you, he does not have a face. It's like fully covering his face, and his helmet looks like an onion. That's why he's called it, the onion. Yeah, he looks very much like an very onion. silly. It does. It looks like an and onion. He's also very. He's he's a big boy. He's a fat little. He's a fat little 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 plump boy. Little, little chunker. Yeah, he's a chunker. Mm. And uh, when when we approach him, all we hear is hmm hmm <laughs> hmm, um, and he's clearly lost in thought. 
Um, he eventually introduces himself as Siegmeier of Katarina, and he says, I can't go forward because the gate won't budge, and I've been sitting here waiting for it for open ever since. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, so this is the gate that we open by with the bells. So we do that, and then um, we go back to the gate when it's open. He's gone. Uh, we see him later off in Sens, uh, in kind of off to the side of... Remember I said there was Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, yes. boulders? Just yeah. kind of There's just a, a part where you're just running from boulders. Uh, so you can find him off to the side in one of those areas. And he's like he says, uh, oh, hello. Uh, yes, I, I appear to be too plump to outrun those boulders. <laughs> yes. Uh. <laughs> uh, so we were like, okay. Um, so we see him once again inside in Orlando. Um, when we're kind of we're kind of traversing through to get to that main area to uh, fight um, Ornstein and Smo, um, we see Sigmeier standing against the backside of this closed door, and he says, "Well, there are three elite knights waiting on the other side, and uh, I, I'm thinking through a plan. But just hold tight, and because we're the hero, we just kick open the door and kill all those yeah. knights <laughs> because that's the way we, we do." Murder and, him. He's, he's yeah. like. He's like, "Oh shit, you did all that? Okay, well." And then he gets us with a ring to buff our health as thank you. Great, things are going good so far. <laughs> Nothing bad could happen here. Um, so we get the Lord Vessel, and we head back to Firelink Shrine. We head home, and we see Siegmeier. He thanks us for opening the gate to Sens. He goes, oh, you were the one to open that gate after all. Huh, well, that's great. You saved my life several times, blah, blah, blah. Um, he says he's going back down below, a.k.a. Uh, I think he's going to Blight Town. Yeah. Um, and he says, don't worry. I'm, a I've, I'm an adventurer. I'll be fine. So uh, we absolutely don't worry. And uh, we do see him at the bottom of the poisonous lake of Blight Town. And he's just sleeping against a rock in the middle of a poison <laughs> lake, which may I remind you, saps your health and is riddled yeah. with monsters. Great. Yeah. Um, Real bad place there says, it is. Not a great place for a nap. He, he yeah. says, oh, hello. Uh, I was taking a nap. I, I've, I'm out of antidote moss. And uh, so we give him some of our own antidote moss so that he can make his way back up to the surface. Um. We find him again in Duke's archives when we're... He's got the biggest quest line, let me be clear. Um, so in our, in our journey to, to uh, uh, off Seath, we find a golden crystal golem um, that we smash. And inside looks to be Sigmeier, uh, you know, this figure, this, this onion knight. And we're like, what the fuck? Except the voice is not of Sigmeier. It's of a much younger woman. She introduces herself as Sieglind of Katarina, Sigmeier's daughter. And she has the exact mm. same... Uh, exactly. There's no reason to look at an image because she looks exactly the same. It's the same character. <laughs> gotcha. <model>. Gotcha. <laughs> um, she she Got tells it. us that she's come here to Lordron looking for him, and so we tell her, "Yeah, he's up in Firelink. He's fine." Um, we see her at Firelink, and she says, "I still haven't found him. You know, if he would just stay put. God damn it." Um, <laughs> so if we hit all those checks the right in the right order in the right way, the end, we should run into Sigmire one last time. Uh, deep in Lost Isleth. A lot of sh Lost Isleth, kind of like the last area, is like a lot of shit goes down in Lost Isleth. Um, so we see him standing over above this pit, kind of overlooking some pretty gnarly looking tentacle demons. And uh, he says, you know, I owe you a huge debt. Um, I have an idea. Let me, I want to repay you. I'm going to leap in and keep them occupied while you slip away and go do whatever it is you're doing. Be the adventurer. And because we're the hero of the story, we don't do that. And we let him jump in and then we immediately follow him and fight the tentacle demons alongside our boy Sigmire. Because of course we do. Because yeah. we're, we're going for the good ending. The S-rank mm -hmm. ending, baby. He's been our boy this whole time. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Um, and when the, the fight is over, he's like, oh, oh, you're, you're here. You, you didn't leave. Okay. Well, I, I, I guess you saved me again. So, so thank you. Um, I'm just going to take a quick nap again. <laughs> So uh, we see his daughter again at Firelink, who says she's finally met up with her father. So like, great, they've connected, they're going home. But he said he's going on one final journey. And she says this, she delivers this with a much different tone. Um, and she's like, she says, uh, if he goes hollow, I'll just have to kill him again. Oh, all yeah. right. Oh so that, my, so we uh, we find ourselves in an area called Ash Lake, which is kind of a hidden zone, um, another end game area, and uh, we see Sigland uh, standing over a body. That body is a Sigmire, and Aww. she's kind of just like she's she's saying like you know, father, why? Um, she says, oh, hello, uh, yes, um, my father went hollow, but he's now been subdued and won't cause anyone any more trouble. 
Um, now, while she says that we assisted her, her and her father greatly, in our heart of hearts, we know mm -hmm. that we are the reason that Sigmeier went hollow. Um, because yeah. we saved his... And this is the great thing. Because we played hero and saved his life over and over and over again, Sigmeier lost his identity of being an adventurer and a journey and and like a knight errant oh. um, if we would have the irony of sigmire is if, if you just let him die honorably he wouldn't have hollowed and his daughter wouldn't have to put him down like a rabid dog well, that feels bad huh. <laughs> yeah i'm sad <laughs> again <Man. laughs> sure yeah, does. Yeah. he's making me sad yeah Mm -hmm. So let's talk about another NPC. This guy is just kind of an asshole, so you don't have to feel bad about when he dies. Good. Everybody dies. All right. Let me be clear. Um, let's talk about Big Hat Logan. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so we encounter a man wearing a big old hat. Um, he's he's kind of sitting in this hanging cage in a, a side part of Sen's fortress. Um, he introduces himself as Logan, or as others call him, Big Hat Logan. Big Hat Logan is like a notorious sorcerer, one of the most like well-known scholars of magic. He started the the drag or the magic school of Vintime, which is a bunch of gobbledygook that doesn't matter. In image 20, he's a man with a big old hat. Oh, that's a big old hat. Sure is. Yeah, it's, yep. it's a big, big hat. That's a big hat. Big old hat. Um, so we <laughs> we find a key in another area of sends, we free Logan, and we say, hey, go to Firelink Shrine. That's where all the that's where the only safe place is in this world. And uh, so what this does is um, there's the way that you learn spells in this game is you buy them from NPCs and you find like trainers throughout the game. So your like basic level spells are, are NPCs that are just always at Firelink Shrine. But for the higher tier uh, magic spells, you have to like find the NPCs to train you. Um, so Big Hat Logan, like if you're going for a sorcerer build, Big Hat Logan is how you get all of the like, high level spells. Gotcha. Basically. Okay. So there's a function to this too, but it's more just for the fun story. So uh, we see. So Logan is just Logan will hang out for a while at Firelink until we buy all his spells, and then he's kind of lost. He has no reason to be there anymore. So later on, we see Logan locked in yet another cage um, at the in the kind of the basement of the Duke's archives. Um, so we free him again, and uh, he explains why he's here. He says he's come to the Duke's archives to investigate Seath's immortality. Um, so Seath, the sticky dragon, uh, Seath is all white <laughs> because he was born, he was born an albino dragon, mm. an albino dragon with no scales, aka i.e. Seath the scaleless. Um, as we've learned already, those scales are the source of the, were the source of the everlasting dragon's immortality. So Seath did not have scales, ergo Seath was not immortal. Oh, okay. And Seath was kind of like shunned as an outcast among the rest of the dragons, which is why he betrayed the others. Um, but Seath's still alive. And Logan's like, there has to be a reason. Like, Seath is immortal for some other reason, and I have to know why. So um, we kind of, we peace out, and we see, um, we kind of, we go through the Duke's arcades, yada, yada, yada. We, uh, we find Logan in a hidden area of, of the Duke's archives. He's just like covered in books. Like, he's just like, Head to toe in, in books, and he's like, he's like, oh, oh yeah, okay, I've I found a lot of things, and uh, he explains that basically he's discovered the secret to cease immortality, which is it has to do with this primordial crystal. Uh, basically, this is the game telling you like or hinting like, hey, this the Seath fight is a puzzle boss, so like Seath it doesn't take any damage unless mm. you break this glowing crystal. It's pretty mm. obvious. It's the most video game thing in this video game. But like, if you break the glowing crystal, you can attack Seed. Hit hit oh. the hit the blinking glowing crystal before. Yeah, you it's mm -hmm. the there. Yeah. There are there are no, there are yeah. there are very few like glowing weak points in this game. This is one of them, and they never recreate this. Nice. I take that back. This is better chaos, but like again, those are two boss fights that nobody likes. So <laughs> <clears throat> it's fine. So um yeah. So then. This is this is where we unlock like the the end game spells, and these are all spells that have to do with crystal magic, which in the in the lore of like magic is top tier, top shelf magic. And if we again, if we buy all of Logan's spells, we can uh, return to this location to see him very different. He's disturbed. He's saying things like, "Well, when we when we leave him the first time, he's he goes, you know, I uh, I'm having trouble remembering." how long I've been here. I, I don't know if I've just been here or I've been here for a very long time. And then when we see him 
at the end of this, the tail end of this quest, he's like, who are you? Get get out of here. I'm, I'm very busy. I'm very busy. You know, he's, he's losing mm. his mind. He's, he's, he's forgetting where he is. He, this is Logan. So Logan has been driven mad by the crystal magic. Crystal magic as turns, as it turns out is kind of like the Eldritch truth, Eldritch truth. It's, it's the, the power of the old ones. And Logan's mind has been melted He's, by this yeah. like ancient magic yeah um and we find that we we confirm this because uh if we so after beating Cethus, we if we happen to go back to the archives we can find logan in the boss arena for seath but we don't really like so what we see we walk in we just see a man in a big hat and and his underwear shooting magic bolts <laughs> everywhere so it's like <laughs> literally big hat Logan stripped down naked and is just running around shooting magic magic wands <laughs> in in this like closed boss arena. So we put him down like the rest of all of our friends. But big hat Logan, ladies big and gentlemen, Logan. big hat Logan, yeah, um, yeah. So the last NPC I want to talk about is Trusty Patches, my um, favorite member of the acapella group. <laughs> <laughs> So in the catacombs, we encounter this man who's wearing leather armor. He kind of looks like a you know a thief ass thief, and he asks us, "What are you doing here?" And he's like, "What are you doing here?" Like, what? And uh, he uh, he surmises. He says, "Are you looking for trinkets?" You know. Is what I was <laughs> um, and so and we say, "Yes, we're looking for trinkets because we also are thief." And uh, he says, "Oh, watch watch your step." <laughs> um, I should also note that when we see him, he's standing to a big old lever that we cannot interact with. And this is image 21. This is trusty patches. He's crouching looks, in a very not so sinister. Yeah. Looks, yeah. looks pretty trusty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> looks like, so a, like this is a clerk outside of a 7 Eleven taking a smoke break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Pretty much. So, like, just to set the scene, the, the there's like an, there's an, he's standing on an alcove. And you go down this like this shallow ladder, and probably like five feet from that ladder, there's this really thin stone bridge that connects these two sections of cavern deep beneath this like cave structure. And this stone bridge is like clearly like carved out, like it's like uh, it looks like um, uh, like a four sided like uh, uh, like like a like a rectangle basically. Um, and when you you walk on this bridge, and you can see that it's like littered with spikes on the either side. And when you walk on this bridge, the bridge uh, rotates ninety degrees, and you fall off and die. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Literally five feet from patches. And then when you respawn, you go back to him, and he's like, he's like, oh, oh my god. Hopefully you didn't slip or anything. My my finger, <laughs> my hand slipped on this lever. Hopefully mm, you're okay. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so good. Um, he's like, that didn't cause any trouble for you, did it? So we we catch up with patches again later in the Tomb of the Giants, which is the lower level of the catacombs. And uh, he says, oh, are you still looking for trinkets? And we say yes. And he says, well, there's some real good goodies look just overlooking this dark ledge. You should definitely just go ahead and peek your head out there to take a look. Go ahead. I'll be right behind you. <laughs> oh, patches. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, mm. we obviously do this. Yeah. And a cutscene plays where he just kicks us right into that pit. <laughs> um, and then he says, the real treasure are the trinkets. I'll be stripping off your corpse. Um, and he also goes, this is my thing. <laughs> <laughs> he literally says like this is what i do um i kind of love so him we, i love yeah. him He's yeah the best. we so we we climb back up the cavern and we confront patches who's just like oh i'm so sorry i'm so sorry it was just a fun bit ha 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 um so we can either choose to kill him or let him live if we let him live though uh he will head to firelink shrine and be a vendor and sell us stolen goods for an increased cost oh good <laughs> So the the great thing about patches is that patches actually appears in the all the other Soulsborne games as well, except for save for Dark Souls two. Um, so patches or originally appeared in Demon Souls, and from software loved him so much they're just like, yeah, fuck it, let's put patches in here. And uh, hell yeah, that rules. Yeah, and it's like the same character model, like they didn't change anything. It's the same voice actor, just like this patches. <laughs> um, <laughs> patches is here. And he, and and when he said like this is my thing, it's literally his thing. He runs the same play in every game, and awesome. we love we we love to fall for it. Every we love him time. for it. Yeah, <laughs> we love him for it. Uh, so he he appeared in Demon Souls as Patches the Hyena, 
Um, in Dark Souls 3, is Patches the Unbreakable. Um, in Bloodborne, he's Patches the Spider. And in Elden Ring, he's just Patches. And uh, Image 22 is Patches the Spider. Oh man, that, that is, is I don't like that. spider with patches. I don't like patches the spider at because all. Because Bloodborne is a nightmare. It's a Lovecraftian nightmare. So mm -hmm. patches patches somehow got morphed into a spider in this universe. Sure, it's whatever. Like Garfield uh, the Deals is... war warlock of this, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> of this game. Yes. He's patches yeah. is the soul's uh, universe's Dexus being. All right. So let's talk about a couple bosses. Um, you can't talk about Dark Souls bosses without talking about Ornstein and Smo. Probably the biggest wall for people new to the game. This is like where I died single the most times outside of any other spot in this entire game. I My first playthrough of Dark Souls, I had to restart from this point because my build was not good enough to take on Ornstein and Smo. Oh, um, okay. They are, they are just like the most notorious part of this game. And, and they're the boss of Anne Orlando which is kind of the last obstacle before receiving the Lord Vessel from Guinevere. So they're really like the end of Act 1. Um, and these two are in Image 23. These two are ready to fuck some shit up. Yeah, they, they sure are. are. So let me talk a little bit. These, these guys, like I said, these guys are an obstacle. Um, this fight pits you up against these two deadly warriors at the same time and forces you to divide your attention between them. Um, Ornstein is quick hits you with ranged lightning attacks, has a spear that he can just like jab in your butt. And uh, Smo is enormous and has this big beefy hammer that can just like, you know, has a huge, huge range. The hammer is as big um, as hit he is. Yeah. It's a big, yes, big it's, yeah. it's a big old hammer. It's as big as Logan's hat. Yes. Um, now, <laughs> this isn't, isn't technically the first time you have to fight two bosses simultaneously. I talked about the bell gargoyles in the undead parish, but it's definitely the most difficult version of this. Um, what makes this even more mean is when you finally, finally burn down one of the two bosses, the one that's still alive will absorb the powers of the dead one and get supercharged. Great. Oh, oh. lame. Yeah, it's like, it sucks. It's it's the it's this game's. It does the it does the thing that Dark Souls started doing in the later games way too much, which is second health bars. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the first iteration of the second health bar, and it's really cool for this fight. But they they do it a lot in DS3, which is just kind of a pain in the ass. Um, so I again, this is I'll link the YouTube video in the Google Doc. Um. If you want to see a good representation of just the absolute chaos that is this boss battle, this looks terrible. Um, it's it's pretty rough, <laughs> uh, but like but like anything, you you learn it. Like I I could probably play that boss. I haven't played that boss fight in six years, but like the muscle memory that I gained when I played it, I could probably like I was watching that video. I was like, oh yeah, he dodged too early. Like I just I know that boss fight. Like I, I know it like the back of my head. Um, and when you learn it, like, it's not that bad. You just, you, you develop a strategy and like anything else you, you figure it out. But yeah. Um, so lore rise, they're, they're also really cool. They're, they're interesting figures in the kind of the Gwyn pantheon. So Ornstein was one of the four knights, kind of like Gwyn's, you know, captains, basically. Um, he led Gwyn's most elite guard. Um, another member was Artorius, who we're going to talk about next. Um, and as Dragon, Dragon Slayer Ornstein's name suggests, he racked up quite a kill count in the war against the dragons. Um, he's got this unique sword spear, um, kind of like a gun blade, but it's a sword spear. Yeah. Uh, and it's, encha <laughs> it's, en it's enchanted <laughs> with Gwyn's lightning. So that's hence why he does lightning attacks. Um, Ornstein was like the absolute definition of a war hero, a war hero of his Sure, team. sure. On the other hand, there's Smo. Smo is kind of the opposite. Um, Smo served Gwyn as Anne Orlando's executioner, hence Smo the executioner. Um, but he uh, he was outcast from actually joining the knights officially due to his penchant for acts of light cannibalism. Oh, um, yeah, yeah oh. hot dang. Uh, his his item description reads that he relished his title of executioner so much that he would quote grind the bones of his victims into his feed. Oh, just a little little bone seasoning mm. there. Yeah. <laughs> a little bone seasoning. So the fact that these two opposing figures are the two chosen to be like the last test of the chosen undead 
is really an interesting choice, right? Because like you've got this this war hero and this like kind of pariah nightmare monster who are forced to work together <laughs> like a fun fox comedy, you know. <laughs> Um, and it even becomes more curious if you find out the real secret behind An- behind Dan Orlando, which we'll discuss in just a bit. I also pulled up. Um, these are also the most memed uh, characters in Dark Souls. Um, there's a lot of fun names like uh, S'more and Oreo, or, or Oreo and Smorstein, um, oh, Snorlax yeah. and Pikachu, <laughs> um, Ro- Roger, just Rogers and Rogers and Hammerstein is my favorite right. one. <laughs> yeah, 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 good. Um, but like casually, O and S. They're just O and S. Oh, an S. Okay. Okay. Um, so another another good boss fight, we've got Great Grey Wolf Sif and her knight Artorias. So I mentioned Gwyn's four knights. Um, another one of those four knights is Artorias, also known as Artorias the Abyss Walker. He received that title because he discovered the ability to safely traverse the abyss, which is the, the dark, scary darkness. Mm. Big, big, scary darkness. Um, and, or, and this is what people believed at the time to believe believed at the time to be the encroaching darkness. Um, this allowed Artorias to journey to New Londo, which had been built as kind of like a like a free state for humans. Um, the four kings, who were representatives of its human citizens, I guess at some point made a pact with the abyss um, and plunged the city into darkness. And doing so gave form to these beings called dark wraiths. Or these just like crazy powerful like agents of the abyss, um, who were like attacked, just killing people. Um, so Gwyn sent Artorius and a team of priests to seal away the city, protect the rest of Lordran from the Dark Wraith menace, which is why when you go to New Londo, it's completely flooded. Um, and the way that they did that is they literally like closed the gates, locked everybody in, and flooded it, Raccoon City ah. style. Ah, hmm. good. Yep. Yep. So when you go to New Londo, it's one completely flooded. You're like walking along the rooftops, but it's littered with like wraiths and banshees. Because um, these are all the like souls that never went anywhere who were just yeah. drowned and got stuck in this like kind of weird meta space between dark and light. Anyway, um, so <laughs> this this is what gave Artorius his nickname, Abyss Walker. Um, now, in order, so I mentioned earlier, one of the the four kings are one of the the Lord Souls that we that we fight. Those are the the the, the ring wraith, the ring wraiths. Um, now, I mentioned in order to fight them, we have to go tra- traverse the big scary abyss. Um, but in order to do so, we have to gain access to Artorius's ring. That's like just like a key item that we get, um, and that allows us to journey back and forth without just like dying. And that ring is guarded by Artorius's loyal companion, the Great Grey Wolf Sif, which is Image Twenty Four. It's a big doggo. It's the poke. The Pokemon. Oh, that's um. Mm-hmm. That's the yeah, dog from exactly. Pokemon it's, Sword. It's, it's uh, it's Zacian from Pokemon Sword. Mm-hmm. It's uh, one of the boss fights of this game is just a giant doggo, and uh, <laughs> and Sif is is Sif is often comes as as one of the fans favorite bosses um sif wields artorius's great sword in her mouth and attacks with the sword and did this 10 years before zation from po- po- pokemon yeah sword was doing. yeah we made it cool big big dog with um, a sword is common in in yeah. many mythologies mm-hmm. yes yes and and i love i love sif it's sif i didn't link a video here but her boss fight is really cool like her movements are just really interesting um she's like very um majestic is a way to put it um and and lore wise, this fight is really sad. One because you have to murder a dog, but but two because Sif is not evil, not villainous, not even hollow. Like everything in this game is trying to kill you, but Sif is highly intelligent. Like it like Sif is is a god. Like she's not just like a, a wolf. She's yeah. a god, and she knows. Sif knows exactly what's going on. She knows that Artorias departed for the abyss and never returned and has been patiently waiting by his grave because she's standing by his grave. Oh. Um, like, like the dog in that like episode the dog of Futurama. From Futurama. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. And, and she's fighting you because she's actively trying to stop you from making the same mistake that he did because she knows that you will not come back from the abyss okay. And, sh- and, and all that being said, you say, no, I'm different, and you strike her down anyway. Right. Well, that's so more sadness. <laughs> um, it's just sadness okay, so all the way, way through. 
Yeah. yeah, it's dark fantasy, baby. No one, no one gets yeah. out of this a, a, alive except for Patches. Patches is the only is the <laughs> only light. <laughs> so, um, way way back in the backstory, I talked about the Witch of Isleth, the Witch of Isleth who attempted to artificially rekindle the first flame, and it backfired, and it just like engulfed all of Isleth in chaos. Land. One of the cool ways that this game tells that story is that you actually get to walk through Isleth and see just all of the damage that was done. And it's just covered in magma. It's like oozing with demons and all this like crazy shit. I talked about like the roots that are growing everywhere, right? Um, but you also meet a number of I the witch's daughters who were also like all mutilated and transformed into these like horrible monsters. And the first of them is actually the boss that you fight to access the second bell at the bottom of Blight Town. Um, so image 25 uh, shows us Chaos Witch Quaylog, who is pretty much a humanoid woman that's fused with a giant fire-breathing spider. Yeah, it's got a big D and D. Wow, awesome yep. energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Quaylog is patrolling the the area that connects Blight Town to the outskirts of Isleth. She's protecting her home. But um, remember, I said to save Solaire, you have to find a hidden wall. Da, 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 da. Well. There's a hidden wall behind Quaylog's domain that accesses a, a, a non-hostile NPC. And this host, non-hostile NPC is image 26. This is this character doesn't really have a name. She's she's known as Quaylog's sister or the fair lady. She's another one of the daughters of Isleth, and she's another kind of humanoid creature that's been warped into this like Instead of being warped into a spider, she's been warped into a series of dead spiders eggs. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And like when and when you try to communicate with her, she can like barely speak. Like you can hear her vocal cords are like kind of like frayed. And she's like oh. like she's like pathetic. She's she's she is and and so what you what you learn is she is constantly in pain. And like she is eternal figure that is just constantly suffering in pain. Um, and you can donate humanity to ease her pain. And if you donate enough humanity, you can unlock a door, and that's where you go to save Solaire and kill the Sunlight hmm. Magnus. Oh, ah, okay, okay. But, right. but to, again, to piece this all together, Quaylog is not protecting, is not patrolling, she's not protecting the Bell of Awakening. She's protecting her sister. Oh. And, she's, and not only is she protecting her sister, but you can see there's a bunch of humanity that you can pick up in the, in the poisonous swamp. Quaylog is collecting humanity to feed her sister to ease her pain. Oh. And you kill them all. You kill everybody. And you kill everybody. And, oh my god. Great. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, another one of the witch's children is a minor boss uh, that you see uh, right when you enter the demon ruins proper. Um, so this is like when you uh, right after the bell area. Um, this is Ceaseless Discharge. And this is image 27. Ceaseless Discharge is a huge rock monster made of melting magma he's kind of like um melt man from um uh, <laughs> oh, uh, uh, action league now yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 i was i was just gonna say i have gone to the doctor for ceaseless discharge before <laughs> yeah. there it is <laughs> they've yeah. got a, they got a shot for that uh well ceaseless discharge much like matt's uh doctor's office visits um ceaseless discharge began his life as the witch's youngest child and only son um, and after the eruption was covered in sores spewing endless amounts of lava, hence the ceaseless discharge. The ceaseless so he is forever, discharge. he is forever, uh, succumbed or punished to basically bleed molten hot magma for the rest of his it, rest of eternity. Yeah. To ceaselessly discharge. That yeah, sounds, sounds bad. Discharge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've said discharge um, too many times. One so one other one thing so there's a lot of hidden content in Dark Souls. Um, there's even a few like complete areas that represent four to five. Hours the, you mean of the content. game that has has unmarked illus illusory walls yes. is, is yes. has hidden uh, content. Uh, in well, it? Amazing, right? <laughs> amazing, right? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's there's the world of the painted world of Ariamis, which is an entire level that like people could not even see and not even experience. Totally optional. Um, one of the one of Dark Souls' mo Souls' more iconic hidden secrets is the true face of Anne Orlando. So, if you remember, we talked about Guinevere, the big big lady. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you maybe you thought to yourself, 
hey, a goddess gifting us this gifting us this magical item as part of our destiny doesn't really seem to fit the theme of this dark fantasy world where everything is awful. Where everything's bad all if the time. If you thought yeah. that, if you were thinking that, you'd be right. Because none of that is actually real. Um, so if you shoot an arrow at Guinevere or just like attack her, uh, you will immediately dispel the illusion. Oh, doing great. So, mm-hmm, yeah. So doing so will activate a cutscene uh, where a disembodied voice introduces themselves as Gwendolyn and says that you will pay for the transgression of tarnishing the image of my sister, the godmother. Um, he says, you will perish in the twilight of Anne Orlando. And we see the lights go down. And as the illusion dissipates, we see Anne Orlando for what it truly is, a dark tomb abandoned by the gods long, long time ago. And that's image 28. Mm. Oh. So, so what happens is that golden, we learned that <laughs> that golden like image, that's a complete illusion that was built by Gwendolyn. Um, Guinevere was never there. Guinevere um, escaped and fled in Orlando a millennia ago. Um, and and the, the gods, aside from Gwendolyn, the gods have all but abandoned in Orlando. And wow. it's just crawling with monsters. And, and when, you, when you turn around when the lights go off, you will find a completely different set of enemies because these oh. are the people that were actually there, the hollowed knights of Gwyn, Gwyn that have gone crazy that are just roaming the halls. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. Very cool. That very, very cool. cool. And yeah. again, I played this game three times and never saw this. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's wild. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. so I mentioned the Hollow Knights, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and and there's other there's other implications too here because Ornstein and Smo, for example, yeah, it's very possible they were. It never outright says it, but it's very possible that they too were illusions. And Ornstein actually appears in later Dark Souls games, which kind of suggests that they were illusions as well. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. Um. So if you find yet another hidden chamber, you can actually confront Gwendolyn as like a hidden boss battle. Um. And he's, you know, master of illusion, illusion magic. He's the Loki kind of sure. connection, except sure. for he's not very witty or charming. He's image 29. Um, he looks like a very frail man with snake uh, snake legs. Yeah. Mm. He's got snake legs and a sun head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a sun head. That's this dark sun Gwendolyn. Um, Gwendolyn's boss fight is really cool. It's so it's very unique. Um, the the whole thing has you chasing him down this like endless corridor. Like uh, remember like the end of Mario sixty four when like you go through yes. like Bowser's endless staircase. Mm-hmm. It's very much like that. You yeah. go down this like never ending corridor, and he's just like it's like bullet hell where he's like firing air magic arrows and and uh, beams and lasers at you, and you're just like dodge dodge dodge, and then you try to like chase him just to get like one slash, and it's a really cool boss fight. Huh. And again, like most people never see this. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm wow. going to quickly talk about the DLC and I promise we're almost done. So later on in 2011, Dark Souls released its one and only DLC called Artorius of the Abyss, which added a new location along with four new bosses, all delving into the abyss and the source of humanity. Um, in order to start the DLC, you encounter another golden golem who uh, reveals an imprisoned woman. This woman uh, thanks you for freeing her and introduces herself as Dusk, Princess of Ulusile or Ulusile. Um, Dark Souls scholars would know this name as a city lost long ago to the abyss, your Atlantis, if you will. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Dusk asks you to sure. help her free her world from the impending presence of darkness, and you accept because you paid for the DLC. <laughs> so you find yourself <laughs> you find yourself whisked away <laughs> back in time to the lost city of Ulusile. Um, while in Ulysseel, you encounter a crazed knight Artorius, and you have to put him down. Uh, so it seems like he didn't make it out of the abyss, after all. Yeah. Um, and he's he's image 30, and he looks dope as hell. And this fight is dope as hell. Um, the <laughs> cool thing about Artorius is when you find him, the story of Artorius is that his left, his left arm was broken, and it just hangs there. So he holds his greatsword like Cloud from Final Fantasy VII behind his head. Hmm. And he's like crouching because he's um, he's like slowly com- uh, succumbing to the abyss. So like when you get him down to half health, he like cranes his neck back and just starts like, uh, he just starts shooting like dark bolts at you. He's like basically being puppeted by the darkness. It's really cool. 
it's a it's a sick ass boss yeah fight. that is cool um cool as you make your way you make your way deeper and deeper through the city and you're you're making your way through the source of the encroaching abyss you eventually find yourself in a dark cavern littered with floating humanity icons um and you find like this is basically the game signaling like hey humanity is linked to the abyss abyss the abyss is linked to pr- the the progenitor of humanity all of this is connected and you learn that because the you at the center of this cavern is a creature that's named just manis father of the abyss and this is image 31 wow. it looks like big evil donkey kong yes yeah, he, he sure, sure does. does yeah so people assumed this was widely theorized to be the fur- the furtive pygmy remember <laughs> Five minutes into the episode, we talked about the furtive pygmy, and we yeah, never talked yeah. about him again. Yeah, yeah this I guess is, I do. This is, the, this is the furtive pygmy. So the furtive pygmy, uh, that's kind of the big reveal of the DLC, is that the furtive pygmy was the one who created the abyss, and is why the Age of Darkness is considered to be the Age of Man. It also explains that also the abyss is super bad, and if you chose the <laughs> Age of Darkness ending, you chose wrong. You chose the bad <laughs> Yeah. So so yeah, that's that's the story of Dark Souls, more or less. Dang, that's that's actually rad. pretty cool. I like yeah. it's yeah. rad, right? Yeah. Oh, I like so I like the like. layers to like the the NPCs and the monsters. I think that's really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you guys liked it. I want to talk very, very quickly about the Dark Souls community, with without whom none of this would be possible. <laughs> um, much like, and this is where, like, much like Five Nights at Freddy's, this game only would have only made only can exist because of the internet. Um, the the way that the story is laid out in these like pieced out fragments and and you know puzzle clues. It's only natural that a community of lore seekers would rise up from the internet, um, and and which is why the game is such an influence. It it revitalized the old school, like you know, the playground. Like when we did as kids, like oh, did you did you know there's like a secret secret level in Mario World, right? Like it's that kind of thing. It's like oh, I was like yeah. playing the other day, I like hit yeah. a bomb and I found this other secret area. Like that that didn't exist for a long time because of like game facts and all these things. This kind of revitalized that because. You can't just go to GameFAQs and say what the fuck's going on with Dark Souls lore. Like you need to like mm-hmm. really like piece these things together, get the you know proverbial like red string yeah. and all that. Yeah. And and again, much like FNAF, a lot of the lore has been theorized and shaped by the community. Um, the connection of the furtive pygmy to the abyss. This is an example of things that people guessed and got right, or that the developers later confirmed. And there have also been things that were widely believed that from software has has said no fucking way to its sequels. <laughs> and a great example to this is the origin of Solaire. You t- remember we talked about Solaire, our son, bro? Mm-hmm. Now, there are mm-hmm. there are a few mentions in the game about Gwyn's firstborn son, um, but his firstborn son never gets a name. Um, Gwyn had three children, his firstborn son unnamed, uh, Guinevere and Gwendolyn. <laughs> now, the little that we know about his oldest son was that he was a decorated war hero, but shortly thereafter, he had had his god status rescinded and then disappeared after Gwyn's victory against the dragons. Um, and you can actually see there are a couple of places in the game where we see statues of Gwyn's family and the one that would be his son is destroyed. Hmm. So like hmm. they're, they're setting that like this, this community, this organ- Gwyn's people wanted to strip, remove his firstborn son from history. Now we meet Solaire. Um, in who says like he's when we meet Solaire, he knows that he is in Lordran looking for his son. But we also know, and he says he doesn't quite remember his past, where he comes from. It's very fuzzy. Um, so content creators theorize that Solaire was the mysterious firstborn son, based on a couple things. One, um, we first meet Solaire standing right by one of those statues. Um, in the one where he talks about like where he like invites you to his covenant, and he kind of like divulges his soul. And and one of those statues is of a woman holding a child, which is believed to be Gwen's baby mama, (laughs) Gwen's wife, but we don't really know about, um, who's who's potentially holding the firstborn son. The thought here is, even though maybe he was stripped of his godship, his fuzzy memory is kind of leading him here to these images of his mother and himself, even though he doesn't really know why. 
Um, this is also further reinforced by the fact that if you save Solaire, you can summon him, remember I said, in the final boss battle against Gwen, a.k.a. his father, which is, like, pretty cool. Hmm. Except that in Dark Souls 3, we got an actual endgame boss called the Nameless King, who was absolutely confirmed to be Gwen's son, and absolutely not Solaire, and did a whole oh. thing with allying with the dragons, and we found Solaire maybe in some soup. I don't know. It was a whole thing. <laughs> so... Dark Soul. So what? What Miyazaki in that particular moment was like, "No, fuck you." Solaire is not the firstborn son. He is soup. <laughs> Your theories are wrong. Yeah. So it's very fun. Um. But you know, even that said, there have been a ton of content creators making Souls content for years. I mean, just search Dark Souls lore, and you will you will be rife with options on YouTube. Um. And if you have played this game or you're interested in playing this game, I definitely, definitely, definitely recommend looking up some con some lore videos because I again, like I've talked through it, I think it's really hard to get a lot of the story just playing it on the surface level. And that's not like it doesn't matter how detail oriented you are; it's just really hard to piece together these things out of order. Sure. Um, so I'm gonna just name off a couple of leaders, like my personal favorites in the community. There are tons others, but just ones that like I have frequented in my years. Um, probably the most well known is is a man named Vati Vidya. Um, he is most known for his Prepare to Cry series on YouTube, which is a lot of what I just did up above when I talked about Solaire and Siegmeier. It's he pieces together all of the different clues and tells just one cohesive story, kind of based on that character. And because Dark Souls characters always die in the end. It's called Prepare to Cry because there's it always ends poorly. Because <laughs> you're gonna fall in love with them and then they will die. Yes. Yep. Except for patches. Patches always it always works out for you. Yeah. Um another organization <laughs> is uh, called Fextra Life, which I like a lot. They're more of the like online guide. So they're an independent online guide um that specialize in souls content. Um less they're less lore stuff and they do more like gamey things like new player guides. Um databases and all the items and the equipment they make a lot of like custom builds and will tell you like hey if you want to like max out blankety blank go find these items go to these things whatever um they also stream a lot on twitch as just like twitch.tv slash fextra life um another youtuber so a couple youtubers uh one that i like a lot dave control um he specializes in long form let's plays where he will like go through and read every item description and like slowly walk and like take in the sites and look at the architecture and say like here's mm. why i think this looks like this and like this enemy is mm. here for this reason it's really cool and, and a, again good a good way to enjoy like get these environmental storytelling approach to the game um there's another uh youtuber named illusory wall um illusory wall uh regularly it cracks open code and looks for like cut content and things that were cut from the game to kind of help further build the like the extended universe if you will so like well here's what i think this was intent this was originally intended to be this so this is why i think this means this kind of thing mm -hmm. and then um a podcast that i listened to for years called bonfire side chat um this is a podcast put on by the hosts of watch out for fireballs who we met i think at portland Todd and i met mm -hmm. um they uh so their whole thing they still do it they're doing it with elden ring they record long form podcast episodes they literally go like level by level so they'll have like a whole episode dedicated to undead berg and it's like you move forward you turn right and there's this encounter it's like an incredibly detailed it's really cool that's this is what got me and they do it for every souls game that's what got me into the series um originally and uh yeah so that's dark souls baby uh what are our final thoughts this is really cool. Yeah. yeah, I'll stand with what I said that I I love the lore behind things, like when it's not just surface level and there's more. Um, I'm 0% interested in this type of gameplay, but I like watching it and I like learning about the lore. Cool. Love this it. Is, this is a type of game I could see myself playing, but also um, kind of have embraced that I likely won't. Um, <laughs> yeah it's fair yeah i think that this lore is cool um i don't think that i would ever jump in because a souls game is a mechanic that i like buried under hours of rpg content that i hate so you know there you go but um <laughs> yeah. it is cool it's fun to see other games that are like fnaf where you know obviously mm -hmm. the dev and and the director and the writers that like they had a story to tell 
but they didn't want to use the gameplay to tell that story. They just wanted to build the world and put you in it. And that's really interesting. I, I think it makes for more interesting video game storytelling when it's not just you know yeah. a, a playable movie not that there's anything wrong with that some people are really into yeah. playable movies but of course um i like things that are a, a little bit more built out it it's it uses the medium in such a way that nothing else could replicate right yeah. like yeah. uncharted is a great game don't get me wrong but uncharted could also be a movie and um, is a movie. Been, <laughs> this you this it literally is a movie. Uh-huh. This this literally like you could not do this with any other medium, which is what I think makes it really cool. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean obviously like I love this game. It's one of my favorite games of all time. I love the series. Um one thing to note about the community too, I think when when so when Elden Ring came out right before Elden Ring came out, um from software, like basically their marketing push was they just gave early access to a bunch of content creators. I mean, they're they're definitely playing the Disney Plus approach, which like fuck it, like we don't need to do marketing. Let's just give Vadi Vidya like a bunch of money, yeah. mm-hmm. and he can just he can just release some YouTube videos. That's more marketing than we ever need to do. Yep, it's the same thing. Like Disney Plus never needs to advertise anything. It's just a new rock star. Yeah, shit. you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Like it's the same idea. So you know, I think they've they've done a good job of, embra- of embracing the content creators as much as a AAA game studio can can do. Um, yeah, so if you're listening out there and you're interested in getting any of these games, definitely start with Dark Souls 1. Um, it's the most accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, and make sure you go to Undeadburg first, because the biggest mistake that people make is they go straight for the catacombs and fight a bunch of skeletons and die. Um, with that, (laughs) uh, thanks for listening to Debate This. You at home can follow along with the arguments on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Debate This Cast, or on our website at DebateThisCast.com. What's more, if you want to commission your own fla- episode of Flavor Text, like maybe you want to hear about Dark Souls 2, or Dark Souls 3, or Bloodborne, or Sekiro, or Elden Ring, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash debate this cast. Joining up at the $25 level will give you access to the post show, the Google Doc Notes, our monthly movie nights, and following three months, you will unlock your first Flavor Text episode. Until next time, I'm Andrew Henderson. I'm Matt, the Bloodborne Soul Premacy. Cole? I'm Kyle. A successful album in the Soulsborne universe might be called Kingmaker Frampt Comes Alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Todd. I can't think of the joke that goes along with it, but something about a famous pirate and a dark city and Orlando Bloom. Thomas. <laughs> we're saying thanks for debating with us and if you think we're wrong you can come fight us behind the swing sets nerds <laughs>